The House will come to order. The Pledge of Allegiance will be led by Kate Whalen from Littleton High School, Sullivan Whalen from Runyon Elementary, Finn Whalen from Littleton Academy, Littleton, Colorado, guests of Rep. Ortiz, House District 38. Please join us in saying the Pledge of Allegiance. I, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Mr. Shebo, please call the roll. Representatives Amabile, Armagost, Bacon, Assistant Majority Leader Bacon, excused, Bird, Rep. Bird, excused, Bockenfeld, excused, Basenecker, he's there in the middle, Bottoms. <laughs> Bradfield, Bradley, Brown, Catlin, Clifford, Doherty, DeGraff is excused, Degree Kennedy, Duran, English is excused, Epps, Representative Epps, excused, Evans, Frizzell, Froelich, Whoa. Garcia, Hamrick, yeah. Hartsook, yeah. Hernandez, Herod, Representative Herod, excused, Holtorf, yeah. Judah, Joseph, yeah. Kip, yeah. Leader, yeah. Lindsay, Rep. Lindsay. Excused. Linstead. Luck. Lukens. Lynch. Mabry. Rep. Mabry. Excused. Marshall. Martinez. Marvin. Morrow. McCormick. McLaughlin. Ortiz. Parenti. Uh, Parenti's excused. Puglisi. Ricks. Yeah. Rutinell. Sirota. Snyder. Soper. Story. Taggart. Titone. Valdez A. Where'd he go? Representative Valdez. Excused. Velasco. Rep. Velasco. Excused. V. Hill. Weinberg. Weissman. Wilford. Representative Wilford. Excused. Wilson. Winter. Woodrow. Young. And Madam Speaker. Here. With 59 present, six excused, we do have a quorum. Representative McLaughlin. Representative McLaughlin. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, 
Today I'm going to brag a little bit about this week about the highlights of District 59 because most of you have never been there. Um, it's four counties in southwest Colorado and I hope you come visit sometime. Day one, Silverton Mountain is the highest ski area in North America with a peak of 13,487 feet. It is also the steepest with no, way, no easy way down. You have to suffer the entire way. It's fun. Madam Speaker, I move that the Journal of Friday, April 5th, 2024 be approved as corrected by the Chief Clerk. Members, you've heard the motion that the journal be approved as corrected by the Chief Clerk. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed, no. The motion is adopted. Members, we're going to do announcements and introductions first this morning. I see some people making their way down. Representative McCormick. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Today, House Agriculture, Water, and Natural Resources will be meeting at 1.30 in room 107 to hear Senate Bill 172, House Bill 1435, and House Bill 1379. So please be on time. We have a lot to get through today. Thank you. Representative Bradfield. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I just am down here every Monday morning promoting the legislator Bible study that is held at 715 Tuesday mornings in room 109 downstairs. I hope you can come. Thank you. Representative Story. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Good morning, everyone. I just wanted to introduce that um, some House District 25 constituents of mine are here this morning over on this wall, and please just welcome them, and I appreciate them being here. <laughs> Representative Hamrick. Hi, friends. Just want to draw your attention to these amazing uh, students over here. They're with Koyak, and they're here to watch us and learn from us, and for us to learn from them as well. So welcome, Koyak students. Great to have you all here. Representative Snyder. Representative Snyder. Thank you. Rep. Snyder. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Speaker. House Finance will be meeting our usual room, 0112, to hear several bills. House Bills 1132, 1360, 1271, 1367, 1311, 1232, 1381, and 1353. 130. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Woodrow. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Colleagues, uh, State Civic Military and Veterans Affairs will actually be meeting at 1.50, 1 1.50 p.m. Uh, in LSBA to hear Senate Bill 169 and 170. This is to give bill sponsors uh, an opportunity to attend their committees. Thank you. Thank you. Rep to Tone. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Joint Technology Committee will be meeting tomorrow morning at 8.30 a.m. over at Senate Room 352, uh, we're going to talk about some introduction of bills, uh, unless we don't. So just keep an eye out for that. Thank you. Representative Young, did you have an announcement? <laughs> Members, we are ready to proceed to business this morning. I'll invite you all to take your seats. Madam Majority Leader. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I move House Joint Resolution 24-1022. Madam, Madam Majority Leader, I'm sorry to interrupt. We do need to first proceed out of order for consideration of resolutions. 
Good morning, Monday. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I move to proceed out of order for consideration of resolutions. Seeing no objection, we'll proceed out of order for the consideration of resolutions. Madam Majority Leader. Now, Madam Speaker, I move House Joint Resolution 24-1022 to the beginning of the consideration of resolutions calendar, followed by Senate Joint Resolution 24-011. Seeing no objection, we will take up House Joint Resolution 1022 first, followed by Senate Joint Resolution 11 after. Mr. Schiebel, please read the title to House Joint Resolution 1022. House Joint Resolution 1022 by Representatives Young and Duran, also Senators Danielson and Exum. Concerning recognizing the first full week of April 2024 as Direct Care Worker Appreciation Week and a connection therewith, recognizing the first full week of every April thereafter as Direct Care Worker Appreciation Week. Madam Majority Leader. Madam Speaker, I move for the adoption of House Joint Resolution 24-1022. Thank you. Please proceed. Uh, Representative Young. I am proud to be here today with Majority Leader Duran to honor the direct care workers of our state. Like many of you, direct care workers have provided my loved ones with their compassionate, committed care with unbelievable strength, allowing my parents, friends, and children and youth that I've worked with to continue to live in their homes. Please join me today in wholeheartedly welcoming direct care workers from across the straight state who have joined us here today at the Capitol. They are, I believe, some on the floor and some in the gallery. Can please, you please stand if you're on the please floor? Please stand if you're here. <laughs> they are the stars who deserve our respect and commitment, honoring the heart with which they serve. Madam Majority Leader. Thank you, Madam Speaker. So across our state, members of direct care workers, predominantly women, many women of color, and immigrants provide compassionate care that allows seniors and Coloradans with disabilities to live with dignity in their communities and their homes. Some of you may know that I lost my husband two years ago to a battle with cancer. After his diagnosis that October, he needed 24-hour care around the clock. I needed help. It was really difficult finding that help. Essentially, I had to take care of that on my own. The, sort, the shortage of home care workers in Colorado is exas exacerbated by unlivable wages, limited benefits, and lack of suitable working conditions. Because I was not able to find someone to help once the session started, I struggled to balance my work life and my home life. I worked remotely as much as possible so that I could care for my husband. It strained me mentally and physically, but I refused to leave my husband without care. In Colorado, there is a worrisome shortage of direct care workers that leave many individuals struggling to find reliable and attainable care. This is why this resolution is so important as it designates the first week of April as Direct Care Workers Appreciation Week. It is so important to not only recognize direct care workers, but also to understand and strive towards supporting the essential workers in this, prevention, in this profession and those who take care of our loved ones. So thank you very much. And once again, if we could give them an applause and have them stand up again. Seeing no further discussion, the motion before us is the adoption of House Joint Resolution 1022. Mr. Schiebel, please open the machine and members proceed to vote. Representative Ricks, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Ricks votes yes. Hamrick, Joseph, and Young. Please close the machine. With 60 ayes, zero no, and five excused, House Joint Resolution 1022 is adopted. Co-sponsors. Representative Ricks, co-sponsors. Please close the machine. 
Mr. Schiebel, please read the title to Senate Joint Resolution 11. Senate Joint Resolution 11 by Senators Baisley and Bridges, also Representatives Valdez and Soper, concerning the recognition of Colorado's globally competitive quantum technology industry. Representative Valdez. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I move Senate Joint Resolution 24011 and ask that it be read at length. Mr. Schiebel, please read our resolution. Whereas under the federal Creating Helpful Incentives to Produce Semiconductors and Science Act, enacted in 2022, the United States Department of Commerce's Economic Development Administration is overseeing the Regional Technology and Innovation Hubs, or Tech Hubs, program, a competitive process to select five to 10 federally designated tech hubs across the country. With $500 million in appropriated funding available in 2024 and up to $10 billion over five years. And whereas in October 2023, the federal government announced that Colorado was successful in its bid pursuing a regional phase one tech hub designation, enabling our state to compete for new funds to develop the quantum technology industry. The tech hub bid is led by Elevate Quantum, a Colorado led nonprofit consisting of a consortium of over 70 member organizations across Colorado, New Mexico, and Wyoming, aiming to maintain the Mountain West as the nation's leading quantum ecosystem. And whereas Colorado is currently competing nationally for the Tech Hubs program's phase two Tech Hub designation and accompanying grant to qu for quantum technology. If successful, Colorado will secure the federal funding necessary to develop a global hub for the quantum technology ecosystem, including quantum computing, sensing, networking, and enabling hardware. And whereas Colorado is internationally recognized for its contributions to quantum physics, and is home to four winners of the Nobel Prize in Physics for quantum breakthroughs that shifted global understanding in the field. And whereas Colorado has more quantum startups, more deployed quantum technology, more private sector investments in quantum technology, more employees working for quantum companies, and more overall economic output within the quantum industry than any other state. And whereas Colorado's quantum technology industry has fostered a 40% increase in the number of patents secured over the last 10 years, and a 545% increase in the total third party funding amount over the last five years. And whereas establishing Colorado as the global hub for quantum technology will result in an economic impact of more than $1 billion statewide and over 10,000 jobs from the phase two tech hub designation alone. And whereas Colorado's quantum technology industry has garnered international recognition for its ground groundbreaking achievements, positioning the state as a leader in the quantum research, development and innovation. And whereas the collaborative efforts of higher education institutions, industry, and government agencies have played a pivotal role in nurturing Colorado's quantum technology ecosystem, fostering an environment conducive to research advancements, technology development to improve quality of life, and economic prosperity for Colorado and our global community. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Senate of the 74th General Assembly of the State of Colorado, the House of Representatives concurring herein, that we, the members of the Colorado General Assembly, recognize the growing and competitive position of Colorado's application for designation as a phase two tech hub for quantum technology and acknowledge Colorado's exemplary achievements and strategic in initiatives in quantum technology and urge the Economic Development Administration and any additional federal agencies overseeing the phase two tech hub selection process to support Colorado's achievements and strategic initiatives and consider Colorado for federal designation as a phase two tech hub for quantum technology. Representative Valdez. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members, please be seated. Um, many of you are probably wondering, excuse my voice, uh, many of you are probably wondering what is quantum computing. I was wondering the same thing, but here's what it is. It's really cool. It's where you take, <clears throat> it's where you take bytes of data and you break them down into quibits, you freeze them, run them through chips, and get quicker answers to, world, to the world's biggest um, questions. So I'll keep it short because my voice. Um, but we are in a competitive situation with Illinois and we want to win because Colorado is the place where we want all of the research, where we want our public education institutions, where we want all of our uh, people to be working in the jobs of the future. So um, this could bring up to uh, $70 million in the first tranche, a billion dollars total and 10,000 jobs to Colorado. So let's get on board. If you have questions about quantum, come see myself or Rep. Soper, and thank you for dealing with my voice. Representative Soper. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I know Rep. Valdez gets choked up every time he talks about quantum. 
Members, imagine that the year is 1980. You might be thinking, yeah, <laughs> I heard the no. But the personal computer had just been invented in 1976. The average Coloradaner person was unable to afford such a device. Apple Macintosh launches uh, their brand at the 1984 Super Bowl, and the world is forever changed. We're right now in that middle phase when it comes to quantum. Right here in Colorado, we are already a world leader. And as you heard in the resolution, already four Nobel Prize winners are here in Colorado, and that's related directly to quantum and their work there at CU. Uh, one thing that we can look forward to with quantum, we've been working hard for microchips. We're now talking photon chips, that's the next future. Uh, couple that with artificial intelligence. And what you will see in the future is faster computers, personalized drugs, faster and more accurate financial transactions, improved machine learning, uh, better materials for specific uses, and quantum computing can even optimize energy usage and distribution, and that's just the very beginning that we know of right now. The world is about to change, and Colorado can be a leader. We desperately want Colorado to get this grant, be uh, designated one of the two uh, quantum tech hubs in the United States, because right now, as Rep Valdez said, we are in a battle with Illinois. They even uh, plagiarized some of uh, the language that we had here, so I'm not real sure how they can do that since the Nobel Prize winners were from Colorado. But aside from that, we are competitive, and we're gonna get this. We're gonna once again show the world that we're a leader, and in 10 years, people will refer to Colorado the same way they refer to the Silicon Valley. Excellent. Seeing no further discussion, the motion before us is the adoption of seven Senate Joint Resolution 11. Mr. Schiebel, please open the machine and members proceed to vote. Representative Ricks, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Ricks votes yes. Hernandez, Judah, Kip, Snyder. Representative Judah, that'll be a $5 fine. Please close the machine. With 60 aye, one no, four excuse, Senate Joint Resolution 11 is adopted. Co-sponsors. Representative Ricks, co-sponsors. Please close the machine. Madam Majority Leader. Madam Speaker, I move to proceed out of order for third reading. Seeing no objection, we'll proceed out of order for third reading. Madam Majority Leader. Madam Speaker, I move to lay over Senate Bill 66 to the end of the third reading calendar. Seeing no objection, we will lay over Senate Bill 66 to the end of the third reading calendar. Mr. Schiebel, please read the title to House Bill 1337. House Bill 1337 by Representatives Judah and Bacon, also Senator Coleman. Concerning the rights of a unit owner in a common interest community in relation to the collection of amounts owed by the unit owner to the common interest community. Madam Majority Leader. Madam Speaker, I move House Bill 1337 on third reading and final passage. The motion before us is the adoption of House Bill 1337 on third reading final passage. Mr. Schiebel, please open the machine and members proceed to vote. Representative Ricks, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Ricks votes yes. Armagost Holtorf. Please close the machine. With 43 aye, 18 no, and four excused, House Bill 1337 is adopted. Co-sponsors. Please 
please close the machine. Mr. Schiebel, please read the title to House Bill 1111. House Bill 1111 by Representative Martinez, also Senator Pelton B, concerning the adoption of the Cosmetology Licensure Compact. Madam Majority Leader. Madam Speaker, I move House Bill 1111 on third reading and final passage. The motion before us is the adoption of House Bill 1111 on third reading and final passage. Mr. Schiebel, please open the machine and members proceed to vote. Representative Ricks, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Ricks votes yes. Rep. Clifford and Young. Please close the machine. With 58 aye, three no, and four excused, House Bill 1111 is adopted. Co-sponsors. Representative Ricks, co-sponsors. Please close the machine. Mr. Schiebel, please read the title to Senate Bill 132. Senate Bill 132 by Senators Rich and Zanzinger, also Representatives McLaughlin and Lukens, concerning extending evaluation protections to all educators. Madam Majority Leader. Madam Speaker, I move Senate Bill 132 on third reading and final passage. The motion before us is the adoption of Senate Bill 132 on third reading and final passage. Mr. Schiebel, please open the machine and members proceed to vote. Representative Ricks, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Ricks votes yes. Catlin and McCormick. Please close the machine. With 50 aye, 11 no, and four excused, Senate Bill 132 is adopted. Co-sponsors. Representative Ricks, co-sponsors. Please close the machine. Mr. Schiebel, please read the title to Senate Bill 176. Senate Bill 176 by Senators Janal and Hendrickson, also Representatives Epps and McLaughlin, concerning updating the terminology that refers to an individual who is enrolled in the state medical assistance program. Madam Majority Leader. Madam Speaker, I move Senate Bill 176 on third reading and final passage. The motion before us is the adoption of Senate Bill 176 on third reading and final passage. Mr. Schiebel, please open the machine and members proceed to vote. Representative Ricks, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Ricks votes yes. Please close the machine. With 45 ayes, 16 no, and four excused, Senate Bill 176 is adopted. Co-sponsors. Representative Ricks, co-sponsors. Please. Close the machine. Mr. Schiebel, please read the title to House Bill 1269. 
House Bill 1269 by Representatives Mara and Frizzell, also Senator Kolker, concerning recording fees and in connection therewith, modifying fees collected by county clerk and recorders and delaying the Electronic Recording Technology Board's repeal and sunset review. Madam Majority Leader, Representative Morrow. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I move for permission to have a third reading amendment. It's a typo. Uh, please briefly explain. Um, it's a, just a typo, Madam Speaker. There's a five instead of a three, or a three instead of a five, actually. Thank you. Uh, members? A five and a three. The question before us is permission to run a third reading amendment. Representative Frizzell. Seeing no further discussion, the motion before us is the adopt is the is granting permission for a third reading amendment. Mr. Schiebel, please open the machine and members proceed to vote. Representative Ricks, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Ricks votes yes. Amabile, Catlin, Clifford, Degree, Kennedy, Holtorf, Taggart, Valdez, Wilson, Winter, Young. Please close the machine. With 57 aye, four no, and four excused, permission is granted. Representative Morrow. Madam Speaker, I move L3 to House Bill 1269 and ask that it be properly displayed. It is properly displayed. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Like I said, we just had a typo and we want to catch these things so we don't have any issues down the line. Seeing no further discussion, the motion... Oh. Oh, it's L5. I'm sorry. Uh, Representative Morrow, if you'll withdraw your first motion and then move this amendment. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I withdraw my first motion and I move L5 to House Bill 1269 and ask that it be properly displayed. It is properly displayed and I think we've heard the reason. Seeing no further discussion, the motion before us is the adoption of L005 to House Bill 1269. Mr. Schiebel, please open the machine and members proceed to vote. Representative Ricks, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Ricks votes yes. Please close the machine. With 60 aye, one no, and four excused, Amendment L005 is adopted. Madam Majority Leader. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I move House Bill 1269 as amended. That is a proper motion. The motion before us is the adoption of House Bill 1269 as amended on third reading and final passage. Mr. Schiebel, please open the machine and members proceed to vote. Representative Ricks, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Ricks votes yes. Please close the machine. With 59 aye, two no, and four excused, House Bill 1269, as amended, is adopted. Co-sponsors. Please close the machine. Mr. Schiebel, please read the title to House Bill 1328. House Bill 1328 by Representatives English and Clifford, also Senator Rich, concerning the continuation of the regulation of money transmitters and in connection therewith, implementing the recommendations in the 2023 Sunset Report by the Department of Regulatory Agencies. Madam Majority Leader. Madam Speaker, I move House Bill 1328 on third reading and final passage. The motion before us is the adoption of House Bill 1328 on third reading and final passage. Mr. Schiebel, please open the machine and members proceed to vote. Representative Ricks, how do you vote? 
Yes. Representative Rick Spotes, yes. Please close the machine. With 50 aye, 11 no, and four excused, House Bill 1328 is adopted. Co-sponsors. Please close the machine. Mr. Schiebel, please read the title to House Bill 1333. House Bill 1333 by Representatives Hamrick and Bacon, also Senator Danielson, concerning the continuation of the Private Occupational Education Act of 1981 and in connection therewith, implementing the recommendations contained in the 2023 Sunset Report by the Department of Regulatory Agencies. Madam Majority Leader. Madam Speaker, I move House Bill 1333 on third reading and final passage. The motion before us is the adoption of House Bill 1333 on third reading and final passage. Mr. Schiebel, please open the machine and members proceed to vote. Representative Ricks, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Ricks votes yes. Frolick and Kip, please close the machine. With 45 ayes, 16 no, and four excused, House Bill 1333 is adopted. Co-sponsors. Please close the machine. Mr. Schiebel, please read the title to House Bill 1175. House Bill 1175 by Representatives Basenecker and Sirota, also Senators Winteref and Hawkins Lewis, concerning a local government right of first refusal or offer to purchase qualifying multifamily property for the purpose of providing long-term long affordable housing or mixed income development. Madam Majority Leader. Madam Speaker, I move House Bill 1175 on third reading and final passage. Representative Bottoms. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I uh, discussed this on seconds. I strongly disagree with this concept. Uh, the bill's bad and, and on, these, on some basic levels with this. We're saying that the government can, can have the first uh, uh, right of refusal to property. Uh, in, in the bill, it, it keeps talking about this acceptable um, uh, type of terminology dealing with what what, f what number we should put to these particular pieces of property. It does not use the term fair market value, which is the accepted term in all real estate. Uh, I think it does that on purpose. It says market value, which is then acceptable according to whom, and that is the state. The state that wants to buy the property, and, and it's gonna keep, it's gonna keep the, the property owner from actually getting uh, legitimate quality uh, bids from people that really do want that property because the state's going to be deciding what's acceptable, what's market value, and basically it's to take the property away from the, the citizens. The, one of the, the founding concepts of this country is life, liberty, and we say pursuit of happiness, but that originally was the right to own property, and this is, a, this is a direct attack on that foundational concept of what America was built upon, that now the government is gonna be doing this. The government's gonna have the right to pay what they want and how they want, as long as they can somehow prove to somebody that this is acceptable, and it's not overinflated and all these other things, which sometimes people wanna buy a house at what would be considered overinflated, in fact, we actually dealt with that for the last five or six years with the housing market going so high 
because people were coming in and bidding 50, 60, 70,000 higher than, than the uh, fair market value because why? They really wanted that property. This takes this off the table. The, the buyer loses here, the seller loses here, but the big uh, all-encompassing state will continue to grow stronger and stronger and own more and more of our property. And that's, that's directly against how our country is built when it comes to um, property ownership. This is, this, is a, this is not only a bad bill, it's not a democratic republic type of bill. It's the exact opposite of that. So I urge strongly, urge a no vote on this bill. Representative Holtorf. Thank you, madam. It's a pleasure to serve with you. Pleasure to serve with you as well. Today we bring this bill before you that allows government to stop and interfere in a transaction between seller and buyer. That is not American. That is not a representation of free market economics, and it takes away from the freedoms and rights and privileges guaranteed under the Constitution, in my humble opinion, of a seller's right to transact, trade, or sell their property with freedom, freedom of choice, Freedom to choose who the buyer is, because no, here in Colorado, the government can step in the way. This is the first step on a road to something that is very un-American. Yes, the young people in the audience need to listen. This is very much something that is not supposed to happen. Imagine if I'm going to sell my livestock on Buffalo Springs Ranch. But a similar provision has been put in place that I have to report, as this states, and I'll read it here. The seller of such property has to give notice to the local government at least two years before the first expiration of an existing affordable restriction on the property, and again when the seller takes certain actions as a precursor to selling the property. Upon receiving the notice, indicated intent to sell the property of a potential sale of the property, the local government has 14 days to preserve its right of first refusal, an additional 60 calendar days to make an offer, and must agree to close on the property with 120 calendar days of acceptance of this local government's offer. What in the world are we doing? Does that mean then that sale and transaction is now tied up for 60 days or an additional 120 days? What gives this state the right to restrict the transfer and sale of property of a private citizen in this country? If it's my cattle, will there someday be provisions that say, oh no, Mr. Holtorf, you can't sell your cattle until you report to the local government? then they have an opportunity to refuse this transaction and maybe meet that and purchase your cattle at a price that they may negotiate or set. Why should we put the government in first position to the bill sponsors? Oh, you say, well, we need housing. But when you make any claim, it doesn't matter if it's property, physical property, apartments, buildings, or cattle, or anything else, you are now infringing on the rights of citizens directly. Now I'm going to give everybody a little hint. This country was made great and continues to be made great by the fact that we respect private property. You see, and I speak to my young people here, under a socialist construct, the government controls everything and has to approve every transaction. Everything has to be blessed and kissed and approved, or you don't get to be in business. Hmm. Under a capitalist and free market construct, the private property owners can sell, trade, and buy, and sellers and buyers can exchange, kind of like you do on the Internet. Imagine if you had to ask permission from the government to sell something on the Internet, because that could be an extent of this. This is the first step. Where does it end? 
You can make any cause a champion for this. Any cause. This just happens to be affordable housing. As we take this slow step towards this model, it's a dangerous journey. I don't want to take this journey. I'm going to be a strong no against this bill because it's that first step. Because the government shouldn't control and be put in front of citizens and citizens' rights. Now, what's interesting here is rights of first refusal were generally given to people that were citizens, transactors, not governments. I, as a leasee of a property, I'll use a cattle example, Maybe you have a long-term lease on pasture that you've rented for over 45 years from a family that leased the grass to your granddaddy and then their kids leased the grass to your daddy and then you lease the grass from their kids or grandkids. And this relationship has gone on for half a century. Oh, this is a real story. It's the story of Buffalo Springs Ranch. And now you say in this agreement, hey, if we're going to sell this property to a third party because you've leased it for decades and decades, now you can have a first refusal in the sale. Or you can make a claim to bid on and buy that property in front of another seller. Now, I agree with that kind of a transaction. But I absolutely do not agree with the government stepping in place and saying, oh, no, you can't sell that. Even though you have a willing buyer... And maybe they want to make a transaction in 10 days. And you can close on a land deal in about two weeks, not 120 days. But in a bureaucratic, slow, government-controlled world, and I've, I hate to say this, but my mother country, España, has turned into a kind of a socialist republic. You know how hard it is to get anything done in that country? Anything takes weeks, if not months. Now we have in this bill language, Madam Speaker, just to point out that I am talking to the bill, 120 calendar days, 60, 14 days first. They get that right. 60 days to make an offer just to agree to close, and then 120 days for an acceptance. Boy. Six months plus. So now we're not only slowing down the exchange and trade of property by this type of legislation, but we're putting the government in first position. Well, shoot, let's put the government in first position for everything, for every problem in this chamber. Why not? What kind of a government do they call that? Hmm. It's not the United States of America. It's not a free republic where private citizens are held at the highest level and their rights are protected under the U.S. Constitution. It is not that. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a first slow incremental step, and you need to see it. It's not okay. The journey is not a good journey. Oh, this is just harmless. We're just doing this for local government. It's funny how we want to defend local government and their rights on one hand, but then we want to put state supremacy on another hand when it's politically convenient. It seems like we can't decide. We're confused in this chamber. Unless it meets our ends and means, our ideological ends and means, or our social construct for what we want to do to shape the future, regardless of the rights enshrined in the U.S. Constitution. We'll just put those aside because we need housing and we need government to solve the problem. Well, if you look around, ladies and gentlemen, just look out the window. Do you see all the houses being built and apartments despite Rep the layers and layers? Representative Poltorf, you have one minute remaining. Thank you. I'll try to use it wisely, ma'am. What you see, despite all the layers and layers of bureaucracy, rules, and regulations, you see 
a response to that housing everywhere you look. That's capitalism and that's the free market trying to work despite the many layers, roadblocks and speed bumps to that progress. Now I only have about 25 seconds left, but I'm gonna tell you I'm very strongly against this incremental march in this type of legislation that takes a journey towards socialist ideals. I'm a strong no against it. I encourage any buddy who appreciates the freedoms and individual liberties that are guaranteed under the U.S. Constitution to vote no with me, unless you like some other type of government. Representative Wilson. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I also am opposed to this bill, but I do want to thank the bill sponsors for uh, the amount and effort they put into the amendments. They made a lot of changes to make this bill more palatable. Um, one issue with this bill is, is municipalities can already do this in a sense. They can already buy property. They can already talk with property owners and say, hey, if you guys think of selling this property, will you come talk to us? And I've actually done that in my community where we've had uh, property owners come to us and say, hey, we're, we're selling our building. Are you guys interested? So there's not really any reason to have a bill for this. Also, um, the majority of municipalities, I'm guessing, won't bother doing anything with this. Um, there are very few properties, or there's a lot of community with, communities with very few properties that this would be even reasonable. This does, if, if we force this issue, um, this raises the bureaucracy in our, in our local governments. Who's going, to, who's going to watch, who's going to enforce, who's going to take the time to review any, anything that comes up? And this has been tried not only last year, but also in other cities that have similar bills. And some of those cities are, are, Cal are San Francisco, DC, Seattle, are those cities we want to pattern our, uh, our policies at, after? Last year, uh, House Bill 1190, the governor vetoed this bill, and this bill is very much similar. Like I said, the, uh, the bill sponsors have made quite a few amendments, but I would not be surprised if this gets the, the same ending that uh, 1190 did last year. So I would ask you to vote no on this bill. Representative Frizzell. Thank you, Madam Speaker. This bill, 1175, we heard in the Transportation, Housing, and Local Government Committee. Regrettably, I was not here when we had the discussions on second readings, because I certainly have a lot to say about this bill. The first line in the bill summary, I think, says it all. The bill creates two property rights for local government. Apparently, I am alone in the belief that government doesn't have rights. Government doesn't have rights. People have rights. Citizens have rights. Not the government. Where exactly do we stop with this idea that government has rights that supplant those of its citizens? Where? Where do we stop? My good colleague from Monument just talked about how this bill is unnecessary. It is. In Douglas County, we have a housing authority, and that housing authority enters into partnerships to provide affordable housing. They do so by a variety of different mechanisms, but the ownership is still a partnership with a private entity. 
It is not government. This is not solving a problem because in this case, government is the problem. We need to be doing meaningful things in this chamber. Do we want to really provide affordable housing to our citizens? Do we really? Well, then let's do that. Let's end government regulation that is costing our citizens tens of thousands, sometimes hundreds of thousands of dollars with every real estate transaction. We need tort reform so that we can build condominiums, so that we can build middle housing in this state. Let's do something meaningful. Those are meaningful things. Those will address the issues. Government owning housing is not that. We have and are spending untold millions of dollars attacking this problem called affordable housing. And I don't think we're cracking that nut at all. I am a no on this bill because government doesn't have rights, members. People do. Representative Hartsook. Good morning, Madam Speaker. Thank you. Good morning. As many of my colleagues have pointed out, government doesn't have rights, yet it says the government has the right of first refusal. The Constitution gives us property rights. We have ownership, a whole variety of things, land, intellectual property, our businesses. Yet now we're going to start saying to the, that the government not only gets to decide, hey, first, whether they want to buy it or not, and then second, setting the price. Well, that's kind of like holding all the, the cards at poker. The government's going to set everything. We, we normally enjoy competition in sports and in debates and everything else, but in this case, there's no competition. There's no debating. There's the government saying, this is what you'll do. This is what I'm going to do, and this is the price I'm going to give you. What are your recourses? Not much. How did we get to this point? How did we get to the point where the government is going to start deciding about our property? And then the next question that that incurs is, where does it stop? What additional property? Right now, this is physical property. This is housing. Does it then move into your business community? Does it move into your intellectual property? At what point do we, the citizens, tell the government this is not your job? This is not your business. This is not your right. The Constitution gives us spells out our rights. We have inherent rights from God. Yet this, the government is inserting itself as the all-powerful to decide what it shall and shall not allow, what it shall and shall not pay, and what you may and may not do. We are on a very dangerous and slippery slope. Where does it stop? I urge a no vote. Thank you. Representative Catlin. Thank you, Madam Speaker. It's an honor to serve with you. And an honor to serve with you. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Members, I'm here um, to talk about some of the potentials in this bill. Um, I'm not going to rage against the man or the machine. One of the problems I see with it is that if I'm an owner of a threeplex over on the western slope and my wife gets sick or my kids need the money or I'm about to go broke and I put up a unit for sale, three, a threeplex, just a threeplex, yet I, if, I, if one of my neighbors or friends comes along and says I'll pay you cash for it in 10 days because I need the money 
to take care of something in our lives. In a regular transaction, that would happen, and it would happen within 10 days. And I'd have access to those dollars to do with what I needed. But under this bill, I have to go to the government, my city council, and say, I have a, ca a cash offer in 10 days, but yet they can continue to stretch it out for over 120 plus days. That doesn't seem right to me. If the city was wanting to buy that property, they should have come to me when it went on to the marketplace and said, we're interested in buying it. That's how real estate transactions happen. That worries me. The other thing, and we heard this in committee, there is a potential from this bill to hamper or dampen the market for multiple unit apartments. If I, as the owner, put the property up for sale, an investor type comes and says, I want to buy it. Now that investor has to compete with government money to buy the same unit. That doesn't seem like it keeps the scales level because you and I pay into that city government. Yet when the investor comes or my neighbor comes and says, I want to buy it, he has to compete with public money in order to complete the transaction. My concern is that this will dampen the price of some of those units to the private sector. Maybe that's an advantage to some of the, some of the governments that think we want to buy these properties as low priced as we can. But the point is that if you as a buyer know that you're going into a marketplace that has a massive player capability outside of that marketplace, will you be as anxious to make that investment in that multiple unit apartment? This bill has the potential to dampen that kind of investment if you're, whether you're a buyer or a seller. Because if I'm the buyer and I want to buy that piece of property because it fits my portfolio or I have a plan for it and the and the neighboring property, when I think about making my best offer, knowing that there is a, a market, a disruptor outside of that transaction, what happens? Do I go ahead and make that? Or do I go to another community and start again? If, I, if that property doesn't sell because of that, we've dampened the market. And we, you know, we buy property to make money. That's the reason we make investments. Whether you're making investments in, in collector cars or on the stock market, or if you're buying real estate, multifamily units, or in my country, a farm. We don't buy it expecting to lose. We purchase those things with the expectations that that investment is going to make money for us as time moves forward. Yet if there is an outside force to that marketplace dampening those transactions, we've done a disservice to the people that own the properties or want to buy the properties, or in other words, to our citizens. Please vote no on this bill. Representative Luck. Welcome back. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And have I not experienced on my side? Cast your eye over the globe. Which are the happiest, the most moral, and the most peaceable nations? Those where the law interferes the least with private activity, where the government is the least felt where individuality has the most scope and public opinion the most influence, where the machinery of the administration is the least important and the least complicated, where taxation is lightest and least unequal, 
popular discontent, the least excited and the least justifiable. Where the responsibility of individuals and classes is the most active and where consequently, if morals are not in a perfect state at any rate, they tend incessantly to correct themselves. Where transactions, meetings, and associations are the least fettered, where labor, capital, and production suffer the least from artificial displacements. Where mankind follows most completely its own natural course. Where the thought of God prevails the most over the inventions of men. Those, in short, who realize the most nearly this idea that within the limits of right, all should flow from the free, perfectible, and voluntary action of man. Nothing be attempted by the law or by force except the administration of universal justice. Frederick Bastiat wrote that almost 200 years ago. His experience has not been countered by history since. And as such, I ask that if you want to live in one of the happiest, the most moral, and the most peaceable nations on earth, you vote no on this bill. Representative Soper. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And it's an honor to serve with you. And an honor to serve with you. Members, I also rise in opposition of this bill. One core tenant of the society that we've created here in the United States, and more specifically here in Colorado, is the right of private property. And certainly, we see private property change hands every single day in Colorado. And if a government wants to have a right of first refusal, they can go to a particular property that they may be eyeing, and they can negotiate with that property owner. That already happens regardless of the bill that we're considering before us here today. But what I find uh, really troubling about this bill is that it creates this obligation in law, a standard that if you have a property that complies with the tenants that are being set forward here in the text of this bill, then you have to be included in an automatic right of first refusal. And I find that really troubling. Uh, first of all, automatic triggers are never good things in law, especially when it concerns private property. But the other thing that I find troubling with this is, from my experience and the experience of numerous constituents, there's also a healthy distrust of local government. There's also a view that local government might actually use this as a weapon against a property owner who might actually otherwise have a better deal for being able to sell or transfer their property to another owner. And in fact, it might actually be better for everyone involved, but it could be that just because there's a beef with the current owner and the city council, all of a sudden the city council will feel compelled to exercise this right here. Even though for all the tenants who are currently within that property, they shouldn't be affected. And yet this could catch all that up. That's just one example of why I have concerns. It's a healthy distrust of some of our cities and knowing how local politics works. It's not this beautiful system that I think we would all like to imagine it is. Especially in small towns, bills like this end up getting weaponized. And I do have grave concerns over that. The other thing that I find quite troubling is if you turn to page 11 in the bill, it talks about when a local government can uh, waive uh, the notice section. And it says if they just decide to decline uh, not uh, invoking their right, that failure to post notice in this subsection does not otherwise affect the local government's right of first refusal. There's a little bit of a going around the circle here that you either are going to post to your website in a conspicuous place and you're either going to be held to that standard or you're not going to post notice to your website in a conspicuous place. There either needs to be a penalty for that or not, but having this circular round and round of, oh, if you don't do this, then you don't need to comply. But if you do do it, we're going to let you comply. That's not how we do things. Public notice means that the public believes that's the action 
that the local government entity is going to take. And not posting notice means that the public believes that that action is not going to be taken. That's why we have notice requirements in law. That's why we have transparency in law. We don't come back around and say, well, because we failed to actually post something, it's okay, we're going to find a way to make sure it works. And that's what's being written here in this bill. That's a dangerous precedent beyond the arguments of private property, beyond the arguments of whether we trust local governments or not, beyond the arguments of whether this stays in the realm of government and something government ought to be doing. But this now enters a whole new sphere of how are we going to treat transparency and how are we going to treat the precedent that is being created here about saying, oh, it's okay. You didn't post properly, but we'll still let you do whatever you want to do. That's the whole basis of having notice. That's the whole basis of having transparency. And all that is being eroded in here. I want more affordable housing in Colorado. Every Colorado wants that. I can tell you one thing that having you know, been in you know, many, many countries around the world, uh, so many it's actually sometimes hard to keep track of, and studying different um, customs, different laws, that's something that I've uh, really enjoyed doing over the years. We have something really special in America. We actually have housing that is affordable. You go to other countries, and if you don't inherit your property, you're probably never buying property. When our nation was created, we had vast amounts of land, so much land that the government was actually giving it away to try to populate the American West, places like Colorado. We wanted you to take your uh, 40 acres and turn it into agriculture, something productive. And in exchange, we were giving away property. That didn't happen in most places in the world. Instead, they were monarchy systems where you had your, your uh, overlord, your landlord, and you paid your few fee. Now we call that a property tax. But that's something really special that we have here in the United States that we should never forget is we have the opportunity to own private property. And it may not feel affordable. Private property has never felt affordable. It's always been out of reach. There's a reason why when you look at the word mort uh, mortgage, the Latin uh, for uh, mortis is death. So it's a, a debt until death. And that's the definition of a mortgage. And often people forget about that, that when you're trying to acquire your land, until this current generation, people thought in terms of multiple generations. The idea that I might take on the debt in my life, but it would be so that my kids and grandkids would have a better life. They would own the land outright. Often it's said, in rural Colorado by farmers and ranchers that a farm doesn't make a profit until the third generation. You know why that is? Because that's when the property is owned outright. That's when the long-term generational debt has been able to be paid and it's that third generation who now can work the land. So it's because of these things that I do find this uh, troubling. I would encourage local governments that if they really do want to have a right of first refusal and they are eyeing a particular property, because I guarantee you local governments know what property it is they would like to have in their portfolio. Reach out to that landlord or that owner. Talk to them. Negotiate a deal. That's how business works. And if local governments want to enter the business of real estate, then they need to act like all the other actors in the real estate market. I would urge a no vote on this bill. I would encourage local governments to use the current laws that we have, negotiate, find a compromise and a deal, 
for which property it is they're looking to acquire. And actually, under you know, current situation, it, it may be that it's cheaper for them if they're pursuing certain government grants or, or bonds to just build outright rather than buying a particular property. So members, I urge a no vote. Thank you. Representative Weinberg. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Good morning, fellow colleagues. I rise, too, in opposition to this bill, plain and simple. You've seen me come down to this well multiple times when bills have been brought to us that are trying to fix a problem that you and I both understand that there is a problem. What I think the disconnect is, the problem is the legislation we keep putting on companies to fix the problem themselves. Any time we involve the government, especially with this bill specifically, we make problems worse. I truly don't understand in any way, shape, or form how you would think that if I own a property, the government should have the first right of anything. In fact, I'm willing to bet this will go to court. The more things we do in this chamber that get stuck in litigation or have any, every inkling in any way, shape, or form to get stuck in court, we do the, the disservice of the people because they end up paying for this in the long run. People are leaving the state, builders are leaving the state because we keep legislating the builders and the, and the companies that want to fix the issue. There are many lawyers in this building right now. How is this constitutional? Private property? If you own something, you get to do with it what you want. How, why is that confusing to anybody? The government should have zero interference in any way, shape, or form when it comes to these issues. I don't get it. I have to sit and listen and read these words and try and figure out what, in my district, People don't like this, so how in your districts do your people like it? You're going to vote today. Have you put this to your people, your constituents? This bill will be tested. And I don't think we're talking to, to our, our people. I really don't. It's hard enough coming in here every single day and dealing with 550 bills. But bills that are literally going to be tried against our court systems and our constitutions, that I grapple with even more. This is not going to create additional affordable housing. This is going to get locked up. We're going to have issues with this. And if people truly knew what we were doing in this building right now, especially with this one, we'd have a serious problem. The role of government, this doesn't even come close. Private enterprise has always been the answer to the fix and the solution of, a, of any problem. Incentivize, incentivize, incentivize. Don't keep blocking and steamrolling. Your vote will count you today. And I urge you no vote. Representative Evans. 
Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, colleagues, I also rise in opposition to this. I had uh, many conversations with my constituents, with stakeholders, with a lot of folks after this conversation came up last year and wanted to share a number that I haven't heard yet. And what that number was, was six to eight percent. Six to eight percent increase in the cost of doing business in Colorado in the multifamily housing space if last year's legislation had gone into effect. Now, I haven't heard the numbers for this year. I know that the sponsors have done uh, some work and brought some amendments to make it uh, a little bit more palatable, as was stated earlier. Uh, but I just wanted to make sure the record reflects the fact that in conversations with real estate attorneys advising clients on whether or not uh, they should get into business or continue doing business in Colorado, the number from last year's bill was six to eight percent. Six to eight percent increase in the cost of doing business in Colorado if you're gonna get into the multi-family housing space. And I just wanna make sure that we remember, we all know that we have an affordable housing crisis. Um, we're the <laughs> 46th worst state in the nation when it comes to housing affordability. We're the 35th worst state in the nation when it comes to cost of living. We're the 38th worst state in the, uh, in the nation when it comes to the cost of doing business. And so I just want these data points to be reflected as we try to solve the problem. Because as I've said so many times before, at the end of the day, we're all in, we are, we're all in agreement here in Colorado that we want to make housing more affordable and more accessible. Uh, particularly to those folks with limited resources. I just question whether or not this policy will achieve the desired end in light of those data points that I was given uh, after analyzing last year's bill. And again, I don't have them for this year's bill, but my guess would be that they're somewhere in that ballpark. So if we're looking at an increase in the cost of doing business in Colorado, if that's what real estate attorneys are gonna be advising clients uh, based on their crunching of the numbers and of the data. I don't know that that moves the needle in the right direction. And so for those reasons, in the interest of actually having a solution that moves us closer toward affordable housing and not further away through additional government intervention and red tape, I will be a no on this piece of legislation. Representative Taggart. Thank you, Madam Speaker. It's a privilege to work with you. And a privilege to work with you. Thank you. I guess I would start this by saying, I don't know what problem we're trying to solve here. A lot of times we will put declarations in our bills, especially, declaration, especially a bill of this length, and it'll describe the problem that we're trying to solve. I can tell you for the many years of local government experience, both as a mayor and a city council member, real estate brokers, when they had a piece of property that they thought would help the city of Grand Junction, made phone calls. I got a number of them. Landowners would do the same thing. Developers and particularly de developers that were going to look at, at building affordable housing would make phone calls to us and say, to do what we would like to do for the benefit of your community, we're gonna need some tax relief. That could be sales tax. That could be some form of an incentive then I would have a conversation with our downtown development authority and talk with them about that. And if need be that we needed to do something at city council, we would get together and talk about this is an important piece of land, this is a very important property, this is a property that fills a need from an affordable housing. It's called interaction. It's called communication. 
It's called a care between the private sector and the public sector within local government. We do this today, and we do it effectively. What problem are we trying to solve here? What city does not do this? Why do we as a state now have to tell local government what to do with a first right of refusal when they have been in fact doing this for decades? Why? I have yet to hear what is the problem that we're trying to solve because what we're doing is making a much bigger problem by a first right of refusal than just letting interaction takes play, take place that already takes place in local government. I would ask you to vote no on this legislation. Assistant Minority Leader Winter. Morning, Madam Speaker. Um, I'm also rising in opposition to this piece of legislation. Private property rights is a huge issue in House District 47. Most of my farmers and ranchers, small business owners, like I always say, from Baca County to Pueblo County, they are private property rights people. It's a huge issue in my district. And then I know that I'm going to hear in rebuttal that this is something that probably won't affect my district, but it will affect it at some point as my counties grow and prosper. Um, you know, this will be something that could affect them down the road. So to say that it may not affect them today doesn't mean that this legislation won't have effect in my district as we go further down the road. My colleagues have beat on this, but I'm going to say it again. Private property rights and private property is a cornerstone and the foundation of freedom in this country. But a bunch of young individuals that came to this, this, this new world and they had been held down by the crown, an overbearing government that basically lived off the sweat equity of their labor. And the founders knew, I mean, you gotta realize these were a bunch of crazy kids that had never even lived under freedom. It was an idea that had never been done anywhere in the world, but they knew that if you had something and it was your own, that that was true freedom. That was the ability to have freedom. And something that the good representative from Delta brought up when he was speaking was, especially for us farming and ranching families, we're in it for the long haul. We understand that it's going to take generations to pay off the places that we've bought. And I mean, if you guys all could see the blood, sweat, and tears that goes into these things. I mean, when I was a kid growing up, no family vacations, none whatsoever. We were tied to that land. Every extra penny or dollar went for a belt for a tractor, a shoot for the cattle. I mean, this is people that have invested every single thing they have with everything that they have. I mean, their children, I mean... We, we all were expected to pitch in. I think sometimes the people in this building thing, the people that own something, it came to them easy. And in some cases, it has. In some cases, there's people that are very lucky and fortunate that their family is able to hand over generational wealth to them. But I think the idea of everybody watches TV and sees Yellowstone and all these shows about the glorious life of farming and ranching has never, one, lived the life or never, two, been around it. And that's why we take private property so serious because we have literally put our lives into what we're doing. And the Founding Fathers knew that as well. And this bill is an expansion of bureaucracy. This bill is allowing government to step into private transaction. And the good representative from Mount Rose brought that up. What if your family has an issue? Or what if you have something that you need to take care of now and you need liquid cash at that point? to be able to get something done. This will affect that transaction, whether it's to a small group of people in House District 47 or to a large group of people. This is a point when government will be able to step in, put a halt to your transaction and say, we're gonna run the clock on this thing, we're gonna run it out and do what we think is best. It's also another unfunded mandate. There are some counties that are going to be on board with this, but small counties such as the counties that I represent don't have enough people sometime to make sure that every light in the courthouse is turned on, and we're going to put one more task on them brought by the state of Colorado. And I'm going to venture to say that most people that will vote yes on this bill have no stake in the game, own no private property. And we talk about equitable treatment here all the time, but people that have no stake in the game and that do not own private property 
are supposed to sit here and judge those that do and say, this is yours, but we're going to put our hands on it? You guys talk about your lived experiences all the time, and I'm speaking from my lived experiences, and my colleagues have spoke from their lived experiences. It is easy to vote on things that don't affect you. But I'm sure there's many people in this chamber that if somebody came to your house and said, oh, we, you know, we think we need to step on your transaction, you'd be like, no, this is mine. Well, then that's what these people are saying here. No, this is mine. This is mine to buy, sell, trade, do whatever I want with. That's the whole thing with mine, private property. And everybody in this room has some piece of private property that they covet, and they would not be willing to, no matter what side of the aisle you are, to let government step on that. Everybody in here, I know it, whether we want to admit it or not. Private transactions are an important part of this nation. The free market is important. And I know that there's people in this room that don't believe in everything to do with the free market or not, but I do believe in the free market. And I do believe that there's good actors, and I know a lot of times we legislate towards the bad actors of things, but there are a lot of good actors. And there are a lot of people that have worked hard for what they have. And they've invested, and they've spent time. And they want to be able to know that the thing that they own or the thing that they're going to be able to liquidate at any time they want without government stepping in and deciding what is happening. And I know housing is an issue in this state. But if we're going to fix the housing crisis, let's throw everything we have at it and not just one-side ideas. We could cut red tape, reduce regulation, ease up on zoning. But that there, again, in point is government bureaucracy, holding things down not letting the market work. And I know the rebuttal's going to be, there's a housing crisis, we have to do this now, you should have no concern, because in House District 47, it won't affect you. Well, I want to let everybody know I have Pueblo County. I'm a rural district, which, shout out to Pueblo County, I still think that they're pretty rural and small town. But it will affect these things. It will affect these people. We can't be keeping stepping on these people. Let's fix the housing crisis. I know that's what's going to come out of this argument is we have to fix the housing crisis, but if we are going to fix the housing crisis, let's throw everything in the toolbox at it. I bring this up in committee. I've spoke about it before. I've asked witnesses, do you think we should throw everything we have full force at the state legislature at fixing the housing crisis? But most of the time, those ideas fall along party lines. There is a proper role of government. We are not anti-government on this side. We are limited government, as the founder stated. And if we're going to fix the housing problem, let's throw everything we have at it. Let's reduce regulation. Let's cut red tape. Let's create a market that will allow builders and contractors to thrive. I'm not saying we don't put guardrails on these things and we try to nudge it in the right direction, but sometimes the carrot is way better than the stick. And in this case, I believe that the carrot is better than the stick. So for my constituents, I'm going to stand up here and say this is a private property rights issue, and I'm going to hear in rebuttal that this has to be done to build housing, and I'm going to hear that this probably won't affect people in House District 47, and I say no to all of those things. This will affect the people and the good people of House District 47. And there are more things to do to create more housing opportunities in the state of Colorado. And if we really sat down together and put our hurt heads together, we could get these things done. So I urge a no vote on this legislation. I urge a no vote for private property owners. And I ask those of you who do not have any stake in the game that are going to push that button either way to realize that there are people that have put time and effort and blood and sweat and tears to what they own. And their voices matter in this building too. All 65 of us have a duty to make sure that we do the best thing for people of Colorado. But one thing that I think is lost, and there is very few times that I will repeat anything that comes out of the first floor, but as you vote today, remember, this is a Colorado for everybody. I urge a no vote. Representative Bradfield. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, I think it's as important to know who supports and who opposes a bill 
because the, the voice of opposing are often the people and the um, governments and the businesses that are in the business of building. So looking at what was, is on the Secretary of State's um, list, I think I will just refresh if you haven't seen it yourself and tell you what's there. And I'm just going to do opposing this bill, House Bill 1175, Local Government's Rights to Properties for Affordable Housing. Okay, Colorado Real Estate Alliance opposes. Colorado Apartment Association opposes. Colorado Bankers Association has opposition. Weld County opposes. City of the Seas, City of Fort Collins Pardon me, they support, but the city of Fountain is opposing. Col I said the Colorado Bankers Association, they're down here several times and they still oppose. Colorado Concern opposes. Lenders Association opposes. Douglas County opposes. Denver Metro Chamber of Commerce is in opposition. El Paso County opposes. Mesa County Government opposes. National Association of Industrial Office Properties opposes. Town of Monument opposes. Urban Land Conservatory opposes. VBB Housing Solution. Uh, let's see, just want to make sure that I got them all. If I missed any, I apologize. But there are governments, there are businesses, and I'm wondering if our sponsors had in any way had, in, as, uh, had spoken to them about what this bill would do. In other words, I'm wondering about the stakeholding. But I will be in opposition to this bill, a strong no vote and believe that there are better ways that to get affordable housing, such as the ones that Representative Winter just covered. Thank you. Minority Leader Puglisi. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I wanna start by thanking the bill sponsors. I know you did a lot of work on amendments um, and definitely kept my amendments chair very busy trying to keep up with your amendments. Um, but that means you were having conversations to make the bill better and we do appreciate that and the engagement we had on the floor um, around amendments. Um, unfortunately, I'm still opposed to the bill, but I just wanted to acknowledge the work that was done because I think that that's important in this chamber to acknowledge. Um, as m many of you, if all of you know, I was um, a former county commissioner and I guess my philosophy was different. Um, I used to try to get property off of the county government roles and into private hands so that developers could use it to build whatever projects, affordable, non-affordable. Um, I worked really hard to get that list of county-owned properties off. And I think it's just a philosophical thing. 
Um, as the representative from El Paso just read a list of um, the opposing, um, she didn't mention the monitoring, there's a lot of monitoring. If this is really what local governments want, why are so many opposing and monitoring? Um, although I'm sure the sponsors appreciate that your communities do support, so I think that's great. Um, but the communities that I represent, um, El Paso County does not support, and uh, my former stomping grounds of Mesa County also does not support and I think it's because our philosophy is different on um, whether government should own land or not. Um, and I want to just close with um, something that my um, good friend and former mayor in, um, in, of Grand Junction had said, and that is, some of this is more about a conversation than legislation. I think we can do this by conversing and talking to our, our communities as opposed to legislating. And so with that, I urge a no vote. Thank you. Representative Basenecker. Thank you, Madam Speaker. It's an honor to serve with you. And an honor to serve with you. I, uh, I appreciate the conversation on this bill um, and want to make sure that we also have the amendments in front of us because several of the concerns that were raised, I believe, were addressed by L15, 16, and 17 on Friday. So assuming those are in um, your I legislate or in your box, they do provide a helpful reference point to some of the movement on this bill. I want to uh, um, talk first about what problem we're trying to solve. And, and the answer is two words, affordable housing. A and it's not the building of affordable housing. This, this bill does not actually put shovels in the ground to build affordable housing. What this bill does is it says that where there has been an incentive, meaning the owner of that property has signed an affordability covenant for that building, the incentive was already there. They signed on that line, and by the way, our tax credits are oversubscribed three to one in the state of Colorado. So when we talk about negative impact to the market, let's be honest about the fact that folks are profiting off these tax credits to build affordable housing, and I'm okay with that because it results in more affordable units being built across districts. What this bill does is it says where there has been that initial agreement, where you as the property owner sign that covenant, to provide a low-income housing tax credit property to the people of Colorado, that at the point where you might consider moving that to market rate, meaning the affordability is now lost, that the local government can match the best offer you have. And as a counterpoint to some of the confusion on how that process works, the local government does not name the price. You have an offer in hand or you tell the local government what your highest asking price would be and then they can match that or decline that. And if you get a better offer, they have to match that better offer. And if you get another better offer, they have to match that better offer. This is about leveraging the investments we have made as a state, and the voters have approved through Proposition 123 towards the acquisition of affordable housing in the state of Colorado. If your local government is not interested in playing in that space, I respect that which is why in the bill they can disclaim their rights wholesale or even transaction to transaction. Regarding the stakeholding, there has not been a person who has asked for a copy of this bill since last June who has not received it. And I'm guessing if you went through that stakeholder list, there'd probably be some folks who said, I don't know why Basinecker keeps sending me copies of this bill. We have been stakeholding this bill with folks who are supporting, opposed, monitor, since 1190's veto last year. So let's talk a little bit about that veto and how this bill differs. 1190 contemplated a right of first refusal across multifamily housing spaces in the state of Colorado. This bill is simply limited to granting that property right for capital A affordable housing. Meaning if you have signed that covenant agreeing to keep that property affordable, and there's only about 1,400 of those properties in the state of Colorado, that is what this bill applies to. But it is not insignificant in its impact. There are 77,000 units of affordable housing that if they go to market rate, I don't know how we as a state compensate that for, for that by building new affordable housing units on the back end. We are in a real, real hard spot if we lose those. 
tens of thousands of those affordable housing units will be up because their covenants expire in the next decade. Meaning this bill is well positioned to solve a particular problem at this particular moment in time. I don't put ledge decks in my bills because I like to let the policy speak for itself and to have those conversations among my colleagues. I want to talk about a couple other things. What happens to the threeplex where you get a cash offer? Three plexes are not included in this bill. Five plexes and above. Fifteen and above for the right of first offer. And if you get a cash offer, we amended the bill on Friday to state you need to match that timeline because we understand as well as the seller does that in a cash offer situation, you are probably over leveraged and need to dump that property quickly. And this bill now says, as amended on Friday, that the local government needs to match that timeline so as not to put buyer or seller in a precarious situation. I will also mention a bit about the notion that this is somehow an un-American concept. This is bill is not the first of its kind in the United States, nor, I hope, will it be the last in terms of leveraging public dollars to preserve public investment. To me, the un-American pieces of what I struggle with is to explain to someone why they can't afford housing in our community, why they would be displaced simply because their property goes to market value, why they shouldn't be able to live and work in the community of their choosing where there has already been a significant investment of public dollars to make that possible. To me, simply to throw up our hands and say there's nothing else we can do in this space that to me, if I were to say that, that to me seems like the un-American approach. We have always been concerned for and looking out for our neighbors and doing whatever we can. That happens well before this bill when a property owner signs that affordability covenant to make their property affordable for the residents that will live in there. This simply says we as a state acknowledge that commitment and will leverage those public dollars to the same good end that you agreed to in the first place. So yes, let's do something meaningful. Let's pass this bill. Let's give our local governments the option to match the best price that you can get for a property and use those public dollars to secure the public investment that has already been made on behalf of residents in your districts. So I'd ask for your yes vote. Seeing no further discussion, the motion before us is the adoption of House Bill 1175 on third reading and final passage. Mr. Schiebel, please open the machine and members proceed to vote. Representative Ricks, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Ricks votes yes. Please close the machine. With 38 aye, 23 no, and four excused, House Bill 1175 is adopted. Co-sponsors. Representative Ricks, co-sponsors. Please close the machine. Madam Majority Leader. Madam Speaker, I move to lay over House Bill 1158 to Wednesday, April 10th, 2024. Seeing no objection, the bill will be laid over till Wednesday, April 10th, 2024. Mr. Schiebel, please read the title to House Bill 1255. House Bill 1255 by Representatives Bradfield and Garcia, also Senator Buckner. Concerning the continuation of the Colorado State Advisory Council for parent involvement in education and in connection therewith, implementing the recommendation contained in the 2023 Sunset Report by the Department of Regulatory Agencies. Madam Majority Leader. Madam Speaker, I move House Bill 1255 on third reading and final passage. Seeing no discussion, the motion before us is the adoption of House Bill 1255. 
Mr. Schiebel, please open the machine and members proceed to vote. Representative Ricks, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Ricks votes yes. Please close the machine. With 47 aye, 14 no, and four excused, House Bill 1255 is adopted. Co-sponsors. Please close the machine. Mr. Schiebel, please read the title to Senate Bill 94. Senate Bill 94 by Senators Gonzalez and Exum, also Representatives Lindsay and Froelich, concerning safe housing for residential tenants and in connection therewith, establishing and clarifying procedures regarding a tenant's claim of breach of the warranty of habitability. Madam Majority Leader. Madam Speaker, I move Senate Bill 94 on third reading and final passage. The motion before us is the adoption of Senate Bill 94 and third reading final passage. Mr. Schiebel, please open the machine and members proceed to vote. Representative Ricks, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Ricks votes yes. Hamrick. Please close the machine. Oh, sorry. Representative Woodrow. The House will stand in a brief recess. The House will come back to order. Representative Woodrow. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, colleagues. My, my deepest apologies. I should have, I wasn't here on seconds for this. Um, I do not have an immediate personal financial interest. However, I do have litigation pending under the warranty of habitability. And for that reason, I ask permission to take a 21 seat. So granted, you Thank will be you. excused for the vote. Please close the machine. With 40 aye, 20 no, and five excused, Senate Bill 94 is adopted. Co-sponsors.
please close the machine. Mr. Schiebel, please read the title to House Bill 1374. House Bill 1374 by Representatives Marvin and Rutnell, also Senator Michael Sinjane, concerning means of ensuring that independent contractors who perform legal services on behalf of independent judicial agencies are eligible for the Federal Public Service Loan Forgiveness Program. Madam Majority Leader. Madam Speaker, I move House Bill 1374 on third reading and final passage. Representative Bottoms. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I do appreciate uh, what just happened here with uh, previous representative Ponims uh, using 21C here. I'm going to read 21C. Representative Bottoms will stand in a brief recess. The House will come back to order. Please proceed, Representative Bottoms. Um, thank you, Madam Speaker. Rule 21C says a member who has immediate personal or financial interest in any bill or measure proposed or pending before the General Assembly shall disclose that fact to the House and shall not vote on such a bill or measure. The uh, sponsor bill just did explain a little bit of this to us, but I was in here on um, Thursday when this was presented by the sponsor and the sponsor said uh, I have a loan and I would like this forgiven and there are many of us in this room that have a loan that, that we would like that forgiven also and I believe that this is in direct conflict with 21C uh, from his words not from my words. Thank you. Representative Rutenell. Thank you, Madam Speaker. It is an honor to serve with you. It is an honor to serve with you. Members, I do have student loans, but I am not an independent contractor and will not benefit from this bill in any way, shape, or form. I appreciate a yes vote. Representative Bottoms, you may speak twice to the bill, and you have nine minutes and 53 seconds remaining. Thank you, Madam Sorry, Speaker. Sorry, eight minutes and 52 seconds remaining. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Again, this was taken directly from the sponsor's words. Um, we have this on video, we've clipped it. Um, I can put it online today if I need to, but uh, this is basically from his words that this is why he was seeing this as a necessity, and I believe this is in conflict with 21C. Representative Holtorf. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I think the discussion is not to personalize, although we all come from different places and have personal interests. The discussion is not to do that because we know under the rules that we are not to impugn fellow colleagues or their motives to the best of our ability. In the chamber, and arguably I would extend that to outside the chamber during 
the work we do in here. Now, when we leave the building, you know, all bets are off. Representative Holtorf, I appreciate what you are sharing right now. Thank you. I, I appreciate the commitment to not impugning motives. You are right. At this moment, let's return to the bill, House Bill 1374. Thank, Thank you, you, Madam Speaker. So in this particular bill, um, one member has invoked the rule. Perhaps other members may or may not need to. I don't think that's the issue. The issue that we're trying to make is if there ever is an instance without hesitation or reservation that should be invoked. And you should not. You should recuse or not vote. Now, this particular bill, Judicial Contract Loan Forgiveness Eligibility, for anybody that is in the legal space, that is involved in practicing the law or have a law firm that this potentially could impact, absolutely, just like as if there was a bill that affected me. Maybe I was running a bill. I would need to recuse myself and say that I have a conflict. Now, that actually happened, Madam Speaker, this session. Did you know that, ma'am? I know it didn't come up, but there was a bill that we ran with respect to um, military veterans affairs and retirement and benefits from taxation or no, not taxing. I know you got to think hard about this one. I'm not going to give the bill number away, ma'am, because it's not to this bill, and I would be violating protocol. Yeah. Thank you, Representative Holtorf. To the bill, please. Yes, ma'am. And I appreciate your leadership. Thank you very much. Thank you. But in this particular case, in my particular case, as a reservist, I'm not retired nor drawing retirement pay. So it had nothing to do with me until I turn age 60. If you're an active duty retiree, it's different, but I'm not. So I didn't need to invoke. Representative Voltorf, to yes, this bill and the content Thank of you. this bill. I'll try to stay on task. I do appreciate, I do appreciate us in this chamber following the rules and respecting the decorum and rules that are set out in the rule book. And I do appreciate my colleagues speaking to those and highlighting those. For those new members that just showed up here and this is your first term, you have a lot to learn. And that's okay. But I think part of this is part of that learning process. So I think it's important that we respect the rules and we don't try to dissuade people from bringing the rules up and mentioning them in this chamber. So thank you for your leadership. Um, and if there's anybody else that's in the legal space that may have a conflict, please do the right thing. Thank you. Representative Joseph. Thank you, Madam Speaker. It is an honor to serve with you. And an honor to serve with you. Colleague, I just wanted to put it on the record. I had a conversation with the sponsors already about this, that I will be recusing myself from this vote as well, because I would have a direct benefit from voting on this bill. I have held multiple contracts with different agencies uh, within the state government where I have worked as an attorney, and I think it's best that I recuse myself from voting on this bill. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you. Representative Weissman. Thanks, Madam Speaker. I will speak very briefly to the, the bill. Um, we heard this in judiciary. Members, this is, this is a really, really clear and easy yes, frankly. Um, an issue that we've heard about over the years in judiciary is this issue of loan forgiveness. If you work for the state, if you are in the office of the state public defender, depending on your circumstances, you may be eligible. If you do functionally the same work on a contract basis with the Office of the Alternate Defense Counsel, you don't get the, the benefit from federal policy, notwithstanding the work is functionally the same. Providing indigent defense services to, a people, to, to people with the right to them under the Constitution, Gideon v. Wainwright, for a whole lot of a lower rate of compensation than you'd be getting uh, if you were out there um, in the private legal sector. Along comes a federal law change recently that invites us and any other state to speak into that space, to speak into the zone of discretion 
thereby opened by the feds with a policy pronouncement such as 1374, creating at basically no cost to the state a potential benefit, again, depending on the facts, on your loan situation, your income, for folks doing public sector work. Sometimes we hear the phrase down here, picking winners and losers. That's what hard policy choices are. Sometimes somebody may end up um, not on the same side of status quo when we do a bill. That is not this bill. A bunch of people who provide needful work, frankly, at financial sacrifice to themselves, are gonna benefit if we pass this and take advantage of a window of opportunity that the feds have opened up. You know, um, to the point about conflicts, I'm personally really disappointed to see that even being tossed around down here. Um, we have a lot of good nonpartisan staff to help us here understand the rules and how they might apply to our own situations. And I just encourage members of whatever party to go and talk to the good folks downstairs who are here to advise us of those things and think deeply about them and will help us to think deeply about them before things are tossed around up here in a casual way. I urge a yes vote. Representative Joseph, thank this you. Is, this is your second time. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The second time is a charm. Uh, members, I just wanted to be clear that I'm recusing myself based on 21C. Thank you. Thank you. Seeing no further discussion, the motion before us is the adoption of House Bill 1374 on third reading and final passage. Mr. Schiebel, please open the machine and members proceed to vote. Representative Ricks, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Ricks votes yes. Please close the machine. With 44 ayes, 16 no, and five excused, House Bill 1374 is adopted. Co-sponsors. Representative Ricks, co-sponsors. Please close the machine. Mr. Schiebel, please read the title to Senate Bill 115. Senate Bill 115 by Senator, Senators Michael Sinjane and Smallwood, also Representatives Young and Sirota, concerning requirements to practice as a mental health professional. Madam Majority Leader. Madam Speaker, I move Senate Bill 115 on third reading and final passage. Representative Holtorf. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Y'all didn't know I could run that fast with a bad hip. I didn't know either. I wanted to explain to the chamber why the members of my caucus that sit had objection to this particular bill, Senate Bill 24-115. Now, arguably, there are merits, um, and there was robust discussion in committee. There are merits to, and there was presented information and evidence to support the bill. It primarily came down to testing, and this test that normally would get administered for the folks that get their master's degree and then come out to begin practicing, or the elimination of the test and testing standards. Um, there was presentation that, that said we don't want to do the test anymore. In fact, that's one of the main elements of this bill is to not do that test anymore. Um, there still is a test for full licensure, and the bill sponsors can correct me if I'm wrong, but there still is that test. The one concern that we had, and my fellow Republicans had, and I appreciate the robust discussion and conversation. I think that's what we're supposed to do in this chamber, Madam Speaker. We're supposed to communicate both sides, every side, the top side, the bottom side, the left side, the right side. Full circle conversations, transparent and open, professional and honest in our discussion and debate. But the issue was, 
Should the test go away? Or should it remain? Is the standardized testing, does it have bias? Or not? The point was made that there was a feeling that it was a biased exam. Which for the credentialing association, my point was, well, let's fix the bias. Let's get the bias out of it. Let's have objective testing that isn't skewed demographically, ethnically, grammatically, or through language barriers. But most of my members and still felt the position that it's not the test that should go away, but the type of test that's presented and the test needed to be made better. The test needed to be analyzed. And, it, and in discussion and debate, there was a, a very strong position that said it wasn't. We hadn't done that. They hadn't done that. The accrediting agency hadn't done that. The, 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 um, they just, it just was not done to a level that would take care of the issue. That's where we sat. We said, let's fix the test, not just take the test away. So demographically, as evidence was presented by the bill sponsor, that um, certain ethnicities would have a pri higher probability of passing. with respect to the African-American community, or the Latino or Hispanic community, which had a lower pass rate. Does that mean you offer the test in Spanish, or somebody has a choice based on your language of birth? Because that can happen. That can be done. Or another language, or any language for that matter, if you're more comfortable taking a test in a different language because that may be the demographic of those that you're going to be counseling, perhaps, in a language other than English. So that was one issue. I think that was the main issue, Madam Speaker. And having served and been a member of adjunct faculty for the Command and General Staff College at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas, for a period of time in my life, having been an instructor for the Command and General Staff College, having been a supervisor for five instructor teams in five states in the Western United States for the United States Army Reserve, trying to meet the standards of the Command and General Staff College program of instruction and their rigorous curriculum, and yes, I'll get to the bill, I would never say let's not allow for a test or testing on any block of instruction. I would say if there's something wrong with the test, let's address the issue of the test and make it a test that is more fair, that really analyzes what we're trying to accomplish or achieve to validate learning and check on learning. We didn't do that in this bill, ladies and gentlemen. We just threw the test out. The one thing in the position that I sat on with respect to this, I said, let's hold the accrediting agency accountable. In my humble opinion, if I could offer a third reading amendment and don't get excited to the bill sponsors, I'm not, although it did come to mind, was we should take that accrediting agency, and I'm not going to mention it intentionally because I don't want to impugn or infer or say anything against anybody or make this personalized against an association that has the responsibility of developing these tests and administering the tests. But I would merely say that we should hold them accountable and tell them that they have to create a better standardized testing exam that meets and maybe addresses those issues demographically. We didn't go there with this bill. In my humble opinion, that was the journey we should have taken. But it wasn't addressed. Now, being a veteran, a combat veteran, and knowing the, the challenges and problems in the veteran space with mental health, 
which are significant. In fact, there's a reason why veteran suicide are as high as they are. <clears throat> the counselors do make a difference in the quality of the counselor and the professional level and the skills of that counselor do matter. Because in the veteran space, for many of us, your touch point to reach out to those veterans often isn't that frequent in the behavioral mental health space. And along that journey for our veterans that are suffering from PTSD or other mental health issues, if you don't get it right the first or second time, you may not get a third or fourth chance. It might be the first time. It might be the second time. But it doesn't matter. The quality of mental and behavioral health care matters. And the standards of those individuals that are providing that mental and behavioral health care matter. Because if they get it wrong during that time, because their skill level may not have been properly measured or given the proper accreditation of their check on learning, then we lose a life. This is real. So we need to think about this as we journey into these very complex areas, mental health, professional practice requirements. I think we should demand the highest standards in this area, the absolute highest standards. And the comment was made, and I know I have a little bit of time left, not much, because I know we're looking at the clock, Madam Speaker. But the real thing that I press on here is if there is bias in testing, let's fix the testing. If we are not measuring and trying to get the highest level of success, or it's a cost in the test, because many people, as many of you in, in law, when you take that bar exam once, twice, thrice, however many times, it's expensive. If it's a matter of cost in retesting, then I say, let's address that through programs and opportunities to help subsidize or finance the cost of that testing to get the highest level of behavioral health and mental health practitioners in the space. Representative Holtorf, you have 45 seconds remaining. Thank you. I'll try to use the time wisely, ma'am because I really want to reach out and help, particularly those veterans, because it's hard to lose a brother in arms, and it's really hard to watch them take their own life, which we call a permanent solution to a temporary problem. Thank you, Madam Speaker, for allowing me to speak. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for listening. I unfortunately will have to vote no. Representative Bradfield. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and, and uh, to my colleagues in this chamber, I think you'll be most appreciative that my comments will be brief. Uh, for the most part, I want to say I really, truly agree with Representative Holtorf's um, assessment of this bill. I think, though, I do want to point out uh, the vast majority of medi medical... Excuse me, Representative Bradfield. We are on thirds, folks. If I can have you, thank you. Please proceed, Rep. Bradfield. Thank you. Uh, most uh, fields in the medical arena, whether it be behavioral or general health, uh, do have a qualifying standard, a test. And so we were not that we were against the test. We were against eliminating the test and we are more for improving the tests so that the biases that were identified uh, will be no longer there. And so that doesn't make any difference if you're pink and purple or, or orange and black uh, or white and, and um, with green polka dots, you could have the same advantage, same, um, criteria for taking that test as anyone else. And so, unfortunately for today, I am a no, but I would like to see the test um, revised. Thank you. Representative Bradley. Thank you. I also heard this in committee, and we had a doctorate um, 
of social work talk to us about the cause of bias, because I was concerned there was bias in this test when we heard a bunch of people testify to the bias. And so I asked, what are the precautions um, eliminating the bias? And she said that the bias is not caused by the test. There's layers of anti-bias. There's writers questions. It's a, um, the questions are at a reading level for 10th grade. It's a multiple choice question. They have consultants. They have a committee pre-testing before anyone takes this test. So her opinion was that the test is not biased. It's the other factors that are causing it. So taking away this test doesn't take away the actual bias um, of the test because it is other social factors causing um, minorities to not pass this test. Um, we heard a lot of testimony. We asked a lot of questions. Uh, they've done 10 years of research. They're trying to get to the bottom of it, but this would be like a physical therapist not going through a licensure test. We all go to different colleges, so different colleges need to understand if they're up to par with a licensure test. So if, if people from Regis don't pass, then the Regis Physical Therapy Program needs to go back to the drawing board and find out what's going on. If we don't have a state licensure test, then no one's going to understand why people from different communities aren't passing. Um, I stand by that I don't think the test is biased. I think there's other contributing factors, and just by eliminating this test is going to do a big disservice to Colorado and to the um, field of social work. So I vote no. Thank you. Representative Sirota. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, members, this is a cleanup bill to the Mental Health Practice Act, which was um, sunsetted and, and reauthorized uh, just a few years ago, and it makes a whole variety of um, little cleanups to the various health mental health professions in that bill. Uh, the, the one component of the bill that has generated some discussion is over the piece which removes the master's level license exam um, from, from the licensure requirement. I want folks to understand that the, the social work licensure is, is different than the rest of the mental health professions in that um, there are two different uh, licenses that a master's level social worker can get. The, the license that we are speaking to is the LCSW, sorry, the LSW, the Licensed Social Worker Exam, which is an entry level master's uh, license. There is still the Licensed Clinical Social Worker Exam, which is required for anybody who will become an independent clinical practitioner. If you are doing uh, psychotherapy work with clients, you will have to get that clinical, uh, that clinical license, which does still require the exam. What we are talking about is just an entry-level license, license for individuals who have received their Master of Social Work. And what has been found is that the exam that is given by this one testing company has racial bias, as well as disparities for older test takers and those who don't identify English as their primary language. Three states have already removed this master's level license exam from their requirement, and several others are beginning the process just as we are to remove this test. Because what, what has been determined is the test is not an implication on whether or not folks are actually qualified uh, and, and able to work with their clients. Uh, the only assurances that the exam is valid come from the ASWB itself. And they were asking for more study uh, before we remove this exam requirement. But what, uh, what has been discovered? Uh, that there has already been examination. The ASWB commissioned Dr. Joy Kim in 2021 from Rutgers University to search the scientific literature for evidence of predictive validity of their exams, and even she was unable to identify any studies that suggested the exams were effective at differentiating between qualified and unqualified practitioners. Um, ASWB is the, only, is the developer and the seller of the exam, the only one, and they have a very clear profit motive to affirm that exam's legitimacy, and the numbers do tell the story. Uh, they have combined profits of over $9 million in calendar years 21 and 22. 
the exam is not necessary to ensure folks who get this license will have already graduated with their master's degree in social work. If they want to do any sort of clinical practice, they are required to do that under the license of an LCSW. We are still putting folks of good quality out there to, to work with our constituents, their clients, um, but this exam is not necessary for this entry-level master's degree. I ask for a yes vote. Seeing no further discussion, the motion before us is the adoption of Senate Bill 115 on third reading and final passage. Mr. Schiebel, please open the machine and members proceed to vote. Representative Ricks, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Ricks votes yes. Please close the machine. With 44 ayes, 17 no, and four excused, Senate Bill 115 is adopted. Co-sponsors. Please close the machine. Madam Majority Leader. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'd like to move Senate Bill 68 to the end of the third reading calendar. I think layover is the appropriate motion. Seeing no objection, the bill will be laid over to the end of the calendar. Yes, thank you, Madam Speaker. Layover. Thank you. Mr. Schiebel, please read the title to Senate Bill 23. Senate Bill 23 by Senators Van Winkle and Bridges, also Representatives Kip and Taggart, concerning the requirement that local taxing jurisdictions hold harmless vendors that rely on erroneous data in certain electronic systems related to sales and use tax that are managed by the Department of Revenue. Madam Majority Leader. Madam Speaker, I move Senate Bill 23 on third reading and final passage. The motion before us is the adoption of Senate Bill 23 on third reading and final passage. Mr. Sheeple, please open the machine and members proceed to vote. Representative Ricks, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Ricks votes yes. Representative Ortiz is excused. Please close the machine. With 60 ayes, zero no, five excused, Senate Bill 23 is adopted. Co-sponsors. Please. Close the machine. Mr. Schiebel, please read the title to Senate Bill 24. Senate Bill 24 by Senators Bridges and Van Winkle, also Representatives Kip and Taggart, concerning the standardization of local lodging tax and a connection therewith, lining reporting requirements related to remittance of a local lodging tax to reporting requirements for remittance of other local taxes. Madam Majority Leader. Madam Speaker, I move Senate Bill 24 on third reading and final passage. The motion before us is the adoption of Senate Bill 24 on third reading and final passage. Mr. Schiebel, please open the machine and members proceed to vote. Representative Ricks, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Ricks votes yes. Hemrick, please close the machine. With 60 ayes, zero no, and five excused, Senate Bill 24 is adopted. Co-sponsors. Please. 
close the machine. Mr. Schiebel, please read the title to Senate Bill 145. Senate Bill 145 by Senator Gardner, also Representative Snyder and Rutnell, concerning the enactment of the Uniform Unlawful Restrictions and Land Records Act. Madam Majority Leader. Madam Speaker, I move Senate Bill 145 on third reading and final passage. The motion before us is the adoption of Senate Bill 145 on third reading and final passage. Mr. Schiebel, please open the machine and members proceed to vote. Representative Ricks, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Ricks votes yes. Epps, Hernandez, Holtorf, Lindsay, Weinberg. Please close the machine. With 60 ayes, zero no, and five excused, Senate Bill 145 is adopted. Co-sponsors. Please close the machine. Mr. Schiebel, please read the title to Senate Bill 178. Senate Bill 178 by Senators Hendrickson and Simpson, also Representative Story and Lindsay, concerning the repeal of a duplicative requirement to maintain an inventory of non-developed state-owned real property. Madam Majority Leader. Madam Speaker, I move Senate Bill 178 on third reading and final passage. The motion before us is the adoption of Senate Bill 178 on third reading and final passage. Mr. Schiebel, please open the machine and members proceed to vote. Representative Ricks, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Ricks votes yes. Hemrick and Herod. Please close the machine. With 61 ayes, zero no, four excuse, Senate Bill 178 is adopted. Co-sponsors. Please close the machine. Mr. Schiebel, please read the title to Senate Bill 25. Senate Bill 25 by Senators Bridges and Van Winkle, also Representatives Kip and Taggart, concerning local government sales and use tax administered by the Department of Revenue and in connection therewith, revising, modernizing, and harmonizing various state statutes relating to the state administration of local sales and use tax into one uniform statute. Madam Majority Leader. Madam Speaker, I move Senate Bill 25 on third reading and final passage. The motion before us is the adoption of Senate Bill 25 on third reading and final passage. Mr. Schiebel, please open the machine and members proceed to vote. Representative Ricks, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Ricks votes yes. Rep. Holtorf, please close the machine. With 61 ayes, zero no, four excused, Senate Bill 25 is adopted. Co-sponsors. Please close the machine. Mr. Schiebel, please read the title to Senate Bill 66. Senate Bill 66 by Senator Sullivan, also Representatives Froelich and Mabry, concerning a requirement that certain businesses with relationships with firearms merchants use the appropriate merchant category code. Madam Majority Leader. Madam Speaker, I move Senate Bill 66 on third reading and final passage. Representative Weinberg. Thank you, Madam Speaker. 
I think our public needs to better know what is being said in this bill, and I would request that this be read at length. The bill has been requested to be read at length. Please proceed. Second regular session 74th General Assembly State of Colorado revised this version includes all amendments adopted on second reading in the second house LLSNO. 24 to 76.01 Jerry E. Payne X 2157 Senate Bill 24-066. Senate Committee's House Committee's Business, Labor, and Technology Business Affairs and Labor. A bill for an act. 101 concerning a requirement that certain businesses with 102 relationships with firearms merchants use the 103 appropriate merchant category code. Bill summary. Note, this summary applies to this bill as introduced and does not reflect any amendments that may be subsequently adopted. If this bill passes third reading in the House of Introduction, a bill summary that applies to the re-engrossed version of this bill will be available at http colon slash slash leg.colorado.gov. The bill requires certain networks that facilitate payment transactions to make the merchant category code for firearms and ammunition code available to merchant acquirers, processor, who process transactions for firearms merchants. A processor must assign the code to each firearms merchant to which the processor provides services. House second reading unamended April 3, 2024. Senate third reading unamended February 21, 2024. Senate amended second reading February 20, 2024. Senate Sponsorship Sullivan, Bridges, Buckner, Coleman, Cutter, Danielson, Exum, Fenberg, yeah. Fields, Gonzalez, Hansen, Jaquez Lewis, Coker, Michelson Jennett, Rodriguez, Winter F. House Sponsorship Froelich and Mabry. Shading denotes House Amendment. Double underlining denotes Senate Amendment. Capital letters or bold and italic numbers indicate new material to be added to existing law. Dashes through the words or numbers indicate deletions from existing law. The Attorney General's Office has exclusive authority to enforce the bill. Before bringing an enforcement action, the Attorney General's office must notify in writing the person alleged to have violated the bill. Standards are set for the notice. A violator has 30 days to cure the violation in accordance with the standards in the bill. If a person violates the bill and does not cure the violation, the Attorney General's office may bring an action to seek a civil penalty of up to $10,000 for each violation, or an injunction or equitable relief that prevents a further violation. If the Attorney General's office prevails in the action, a court may issue an order requiring the violator to pay reasonable attorney fees and costs incurred in bringing the action. 1. Be it enacted by the General Assembly of the State of Colorado, 2. Section 1. In Colorado Revised Statutes, add Part 2 to Article 327 of Title 6 as follows, for Part 2 5 payment processing for 6 retail sales of firearms 76-27-201. Definitions. As used in this Part 2, unless the 8 context otherwise requires, 9. 1. Attorney General, includes an Attorney General's 10 designee acting within the scope of the designee's duties as an 11 employee of the Attorney General's office. 12, 2, firearm, has the meaning set forth in section 18-1-90113, 3, H. 14, 3, firearm accessory, means a device designed or 15 adapted TOB inserted into, attached to, or used with a firearm 16 if the device alters, 17, A, the firing capabilities of the firearm, 18, B, the lethality of the firearm, or. Dash 2, 0, 66. 1, C, the shooter's ability TO hold or use the firearm. 2, 4, firearms merchant, means a business that, 3, A, IS physically located in Colorado, 4, B, acquires and sells firearms, firearm accessories, and 5 firearm ammunition with the intention of making a profit, and 6, C, has ITS highest gross revenue or expected gross 7 revenue from the combined sale in Colorado of firearms, firearm 8 accessories, or firearm ammunition, AS stated by the business 29 ITS merchant acquirer in the ordinary course of business. 10, 5, merchant acquirer, means a person with a 11 relationship with a merchant for the purposes of processing 12 credit, debit, or prepaid transactions. 13, 6, merchant category code for firearms, or, code, 14 means the merchant category code for firearms and ammunition 15 businesses established by the International Organization for 16 standardization on September 9, 2022. 17, 7, payment card network, means a person that provides. 18 services to route transactions between bank participants to. 19 conduct debit, credit, or prepaid transactions for the purposes 20 of authorization, clearance, or settlement. 216-27-202. Payment card network, merchant category code. 22 on and after September 1, 2024, a payment card network shall 23 make the merchant category code for firearms available for 24 merchant acquirers that provide payment services for firearms 25 merchants. 26-6-27-203. Merchant acquirer, merchant category. 
Effective May 27, 1, 2025, a merchant acquirer shall assign the merchant. Dash 3, 0, 066. One category code for firearms to each firearms merchant to which two the merchant acquirer provides services. 36-27-204. Waivers void. A contractual waiver of this part 42 is void because the waiver is contrary to public policy. 56-27-205. Attorney General, Exclusive Enforcement Authority. 6. The Attorney General has exclusive authority to enforce this 7 Part 2, which does not grant any other person authority to 8 bring a civil action to enforce this Part 2 or seek damages as a 9 result of a violation of this Part 2. 106-27-206. Enforcement. 1. Not fewer than 45 days 11 before bringing an action under subsection, 3, of this section. 12. The Attorney General must notify in writing the person alleged 13 to be in violation of this Part 2. A court shall dismiss, without 14 prejudice, an action until the Attorney General has complied 15 with this subsection, 1. The notice must contain, 16, a, each specific provision of this Part 2 that is alleged to. 17 have been violated, and 18, b, the acts or omissions that are alleged to have a 19 violated each provision described in subsection, 1, a, of this 20 section. 21, 2, the Attorney General shall not bring an action under 22 this section if the person that receives the notice described in 23 subsection, 1, of this section, 24, a, cures the described violation within 30 days after 25 receiving the notice, 26, b, provides the Attorney General a written statement, 27 made under penalty of perjury, that the person has, dash 4, 0, 066, 1, i, cured the violation, and 2, 2, made any necessary changes to the person's internal 3 policies to prevent future violations of this section, and 4, c, provides any necessary supporting documentation 5 that shows how the violation was cured. 6, 3, a person that violates this part 2 and does not cure 7 the violation in accordance with subsections, 2, a, 2, 2, c, of 8 this section is subject to the following and the attorney 9 general may file an action seeking, 10, a, a civil penalty of up to $10,000 for each 11 violation, or 12, b, an injunction or equitable relief that prevents a 13 further violation of this part 2. 14, 4. If the Attorney General prevails in an action brought 15 pursuant to this Part 2, a court may issue an order requiring the 16 violator to pay reasonable attorney fees and costs incurred in 17 bringing the action. 18 Section 2. In Colorado Revised Statutes, add 11-30-127 as 19 follows. 2011-30-127. Merchant Code for Firearms. A Payment Card. 21 Network, as defined in Section 6-27-201-7, or a Merchant 22 Acquirer, as defined in Section 6-27-201-5, shall comply with 23 Part 2 of Article 27 of Title 6. 24 Section 3. In Colorado Revised Statutes, add 11-105-211 as 25 follows, 2611-105-211. Merchant Code for Firearms. A Payment Card 27 Network, as defined in Section 6-27-201-7, or a Merchant. Dash 5, 0, 066. One acquirer, as defined in Section 6-27-201-5, shall comply with 2 Part 2 of Article 27 of Title 6. 3 Section 4. In Colorado Revised Statutes, amend 6-27-101 as 4 follows, 56-27-101. Short Title. The short title of this Article 27 Part 1 is 6 The Jesse Redfield Goyes Act for Gun Violence Victims Access to 7 Justice and Firearms Industry Accountability. 8 Section 5. In Colorado Revised Statutes, 6-27-103, amend the 9 introductory portion as follows, 106-27-103. Definitions. As used in this Article 27 Part 1, unless 11 the context otherwise requires, 12 Section 6. In Colorado Revised Statutes, 6-27-105, amend, 1, 13, 2, 3, A, 3, D, and, 4, as follows, 14 6-27-105. Cause of action for violations of standards of 15 responsible conduct. 1. A person or entity that has suffered harm as a 16 result of a firearm industry member's acts or omissions in knowing 17 violation of section 6-27-104 may bring a civil action pursuant to this. 18 Article 27 Part 1 in a court of competent jurisdiction. 19. 2. The Attorney General, or the Attorney General's designee, May 20th bring a civil action in a court of competent jurisdiction to enforce this 21 Article 27 Part 1 and remedy harms caused by any acts or omissions in 22 knowing violation of section 6-27-104. 23, 3, in an action brought pursuant to this section, if the court 24 determines that a firearm industry member engaged in conduct in 25 violation of section 6-27-104, the court shall award just and appropriate 26 relief, which may include but is not limited to, 27, a, injunctive relief sufficient to prevent the firearm industry. Dash 6, 0, 066. One member and any other defendant from further violating this Article 27 2 Part 1, 3, D, any other just and appropriate relief necessary to enforce this 4 Article 27 Part 1 and remedy the harm caused by the violation. 
5, 4, in an action brought pursuant to this Article 27 Part 1, and 6 notwithstanding any intervening act by a third party, if a firearm industry 7 members knowing violation of this Article 27 Part 1 creates a reasonably 8 foreseeable risk that harm would occur, the firearm industry members a 9 violation is presumed to be the proximate cause of the harm suffered by 10 the plaintiff. 11 Section 7. In Colorado Revised Statutes, Amend 6-27-106 as 12 follows, 136-27-106. Limitations. 1. Nothing in this Article 27 Part 114 limits or impairs in any way the right of the Attorney General, or any 15 person or entity, to pursue a legal action pursuant to any other law, cause 16 of action, tort theory, or other authority. 17. 2. Nothing in this Article 27 Part 1 limits or impairs in any way. 18. An obligation or requirement placed on a firearm industry member by any 19 other authority. 20. 3. This Article 27 Part 1 must be construed and applied in a 21 manner that is consistent with the requirements of the Constitutions of 22 Colorado and the United States. 23 Section 8. Act subject to petition, effective date. This Act 24 takes effect at 12.01 a.m. on the day following the expiration of the 25-90-day period after final adjournment of the General Assembly, except 26 that, if a referendum petition is filed pursuant to Section 1, 3, of Article V. 27 of the State Constitution against this Act or an item, section, or part of this. Dash 7, 066. One Act within such period, then the Act, item, section, or part will not take. Two effect unless approved by the people at the general election to be held in. November 3, 2024 and, in such case, will take effect on the date of the for official declaration of the vote thereon by the Governor. Dash 8, 066. Representative Weinberg. To the bill. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Fellow colleagues, firearm merchant category codes. What's next? Are we seriously taking this, like, to heart? This is ludicrous. There's absolutely no reason, shape, or form we should be even discussing this in this chamber. Out of everything we've been through in this state and in this country, coming out of COVID, members, with all the problems that we have. Excuse me, Rep. Weinberg. Members, we are on thirds. Please, no conversations. Thank you, Rep. Thank Weinberg. you, Madam Speaker. I appreciate that. With all the serious problems we have in this state currently, this is the topic we decide to talk about? These are the bills that you decide to pass out of this chamber? I said it once, I'll say it again, ludicrous. I hear your district's problems. Do you? Not one person in this state is complaining about this. There is zero reason, zero reason to pass such legislation. We have serious problems in the state. And this does nothing to fix it. There are 30 days left. Let me remind everybody. 30 days left. And this is the last thing that we should be choosing to address. Merchant codes do not stop school shootings. Merchant codes do not stop somebody who is mentally ill walking in a King's Supers to gun down innocent civilians. It does not address the core problem in any way, shape, or form. address the problems within the state, and stay away from the Second Amendment. This is unconstitutional, will be challenged, and I would suggest 
that you look deep today as to how your vote's going to be placed on that green-red because your constituents will be watching. We've received the leaflets. We've received our pamphlets. Those are people from our district. And we need to take that seriously. Listen to the people you represent. This is a slippery slope down a terrible hill. We, we swear an oath. We swear an oath in this building. We swear an oath. Uphold your oaths and understand very clearly this is wrong. I'm in obvious opposition of this bill. And I would urge everybody in this chamber to vote no on Senate Bill 24-066. Representative Taggart. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'll let my colleagues talk about the concern on the Second Amendment, which I agree with them wholeheartedly. But I look at this from a business standpoint and see a good number of inconsistencies, inequities, and an invasion of privacy for those of us as consumers. Let me start with the ISO. I won't read for you what I read during the second reading on this, but the ISO was not put in place for this purpose. The codes were put in place years ago, and I was a member. They were put in place for the purpose of improving the quality of products, well, first off, identifying product categories, identifying the quality and performance of products, and on process improvement. The ISO never put these codes in place for the purpose of tracking individuals buying specific product categories. This was not the purpose and is not the purpose of ISO. ISO's purpose has always been to protect the consumer from the standpoint of providing the highest quality, highest performance products. And I think I raised with you, they have a standard that is very difficult to gain. It's called ISO 9000. It is very difficult to gain. It takes years to prove that your process is worthy of the ISO 9000 standard. And to quote it in this bill as if it's the standard for consumers purchasing a firearm is completely misstating what ISO stands for. Secondly, this bill is not consistent. It's aimed at independent stores that sell firearms and doesn't approach sporting goods stores whatsoever. I don't know the percentage of firearms that are sold in sporting goods stores as compared to independent but I know there's some very large ones out there that I can't repeat their names here. You can't introduce a bill that is not consistent, that doesn't hold the entire retail network to the same set of standards. That alone violates ISO standards. I'll state that again. That alone violates ISO standards. Thirdly, 
payment card network. Every one of us that has a relationship with one of the major credit card companies of the world does that with the concept of privacy. They will provide information to industries and industry associations, but guess what? You pay for that. And they don't say the individual under any circumstances. What they do is give us in business another data source that we can analyze for the purpose of understanding how our products are sell selling to a particular demographic, to a particular psychographic, and to a, a particular geographic. It is not down to the individual. And you can't get it down to the individual without violating privacy laws. There's a reason why credit cards, why there are such high levels of security standards, and in some cases encryption, is to protect us as consumers on privacy. And now we're saying, by way of this bill, that we're willing to put those payment card networks on notice that they have to provide this information at the expense of their consumers and they can be fined if they do not. We are also circumventing due process. If law enforcement in our judicial system wants information about a particular consumer purchase, they can use the route that we've had for years, and that's called a warrant. This gets around the basic principles of our judicial system. I'm sorry, folks. Privacy is something we have to honor and protect at all lengths. I understand there are bad apples out there. But what we're doing is stepping on privacy. We're using an ISO standard that has nothing to do with this subject improperly. I cannot stand behind a bill under any circumstances that circumvents our laws and our rights as individuals. Thank you. Representative Frizzell. Thank you, Madam Speaker. You know, let's just admit what's going on. Our constituents expect for us to come down here and have meaningful and hopefully truthful conversations. So let's just admit what is going on. Since the federal government is forbidden by law from creating a searchable database of gun owners, this task is simply being outsourced to private industry. That's what this is about, so let's just admit it. My good colleague from Grand Junction has talked a lot about the business side of this, and the business side is important. And the reason why the business side is important is because as we discussed last week, this law is not currently implementable. I think that's a word. Credit card companies have backed off from implementing this code. I'd like to say that Colorado is super um, novel in their approach, but they're not. 
The state of California actually beat us to this. And oddly enough, they have the same penalty, $10,000, for each violation that would be imposed on the credit card company. So they passed their law, the California law, in 2022, goes into effect July 2024. And I'm, I'm looking at of websites, the California Credit Union League, because they have a vested interest in that. Some of the credit unions have credit cards. And so they are trying to apprise their members of what's going on in California. And so it says, since certain states now mandate different, sometimes opposite requirements on card payment processors relating to adoption of the MCC for firearms merchants, those companies are now holding off on implementing the MCC in their processes. MasterCard and Visa have publicly stated that lawmakers appear to misunderstand the purpose and effect of the MCC. So is the state of Colorado going to be imposing $10,000 fines for each violation on an industry that is simply not prepared structurally or legally to implement this? I'm curious. I think that's problematic. I have a lot of problems with this bill. You know, that I got to hear this bill in committee. We heard about various perpetrators of mass, mass casualty events and how this would maybe have stopped that. And I really question that because many of the mass casualty events either spread their purchases amongst various retailers. And oh, by the way, there's a huge loophole to this because this only affects a small number of business owners, firearms dealers specifically. It's picking them out. Let's be honest about that too. Why are we picking on a specific group of business owners? I think that's unfair. I also said in committee that maybe it's a good thing because they aren't going to be, those, those small businesses aren't going to be incurring as many credit card fees that they have to pay. Because people are just simply going to buy their ammunition and firearms with cash. I want us to be honest with ourselves. Honest with the taxpayers, the citizens of this state. Let's just be honest. These bills that we are seeing in this session, what I've referred to as death by a thousand cuts, is trying to do away with an entire industry. It's trying to punish people who own guns for safety, security, and sport. That's what it's for. Let's just be honest. I'm a no vote. Representative Lynch. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, so I heard this in committee late into the night. Um, and I want to share some of the stuff that went on in committee, because I think that's important, because a lot of times we don't hear what, what went on in committee. And, and the committee was, was, for folks that were against this bill, was overwhelmingly with small gun shops that were talking about 
uh, trying to fix this problem. And, and, and keep in mind that the spirit behind this is that we will uh, have a tool that will enable us to keep mass shooting events from happening in the future by gathering data about a purchase. But um, as my colleague from Grand Junction noted that a, this won't affect any, anybody that goes to a, a big box store because they're going to be, their MCC code will be simple, it'll be sporting goods. And, it, and so it really only affects the small gun stores where the majority of what they sell are firearms. And you know, it was interesting that the, the folks that came from those small um, stores actually wanted to help, they want to help in this problem. And so they said, hey, instead of wasting time with, with documenting what people are buying on their credit cards at my store, give us a path, give us a method of, of reporting when we see suspicious activity. When we see somebody come in and they want to buy a bunch uh, of firearms or they're acting erratic or they're not acting right, give us a way of doing that. So we actually had in committee, we had gun store owners come and say, hey, let us try to fix this problem. Let us, you know, ask us, we're the ones selling the, the guns, what we can do to, to help out with this. This will not do anything. T today, we are now gathering the data of people that are, are buying firearms or ammunition. Um, and, and this bill doesn't allow us today to do anything with that ahead of time. That's, that's this year's bill. What I'm really concerned about is next year's bill when we are proactively taking that data and then acting on it. Um, all these things happen incrementally. Um, you know, the, the, other, the other issue was that this is a privacy issue. This is a Fourth Amendment. That, that it's nobody's business what you're spending your money on and your credit cards unless they're going to market to you. That's the, biggest, that's the biggest use of MCC codes. They can figure out where you're spending your money. And um, so, you know, if we're capturing this now, I'm sure there will be... Uh, the ability for people to, to now sell more to these people because now we know who's spending money on it and so now the marketers will be able to get to them better, let them do it online, let them do it um, outside of, the, uh, outside of that, that gun store. And then the other thing we also heard is that what's going to happen is all these law-abiding citizens are now, because they don't want to be tracked, they don't want to be part of what is the precursor to a gun registry, they're just going to buy stuff with cash. The other aspect of this is that, hey, California did it. That's a great idea. So we should exactly duplicate what they did in California. Um, I, I really, really get uh, worn out with us trying to copy what other states do and not be the leaders that we are in Colorado by being, I don't know, uh, unique in some of our legislation instead of copying stuff that they're doing in California. And we've seen that that, um, as my colleague from Douglas County said that doesn't really do much. So anyway, so I wanted to share with you what went on in committee, uh, what the gun store owners that will be the target of this, not the Cabela's, not the Walmart. I mean, if anything comes out of this, we're really just going to increase the sales at some of these bigger box stores and, and hurt those smaller gun stores. Um, and, and all along, we're, we're just taking law-abiding citizens and trying to vilify them and trying to put them into a category that they don't deserve to be in. So, um, like I said, this data today, harmless. Next year, when they're now using that proactively, uh, could be very dangerous. Please vote no on this. Representative Evans. Well, good afternoon, colleagues. Um, I also rise in opposition to this bill, and I just want to make sure that we remember some of the conversations that we've had about this. As you just heard my uh, colleague talk about, this bill is full of false positives and false negatives because these uh, merchant category codes, they're not line items, they're not receipts, they don't track what you purchased, they track the merchant from which you purchased these goods. And so as we talked about before, you have an opportunity for a tremendous amount of false positives to emerge. Think about your local hunting bait and tackle store. It sells firearms, sells ammunition for hunting, also sells uh, fishing lures, fishing line, rods, reels, that sort of stuff. If I go to such a store and I spend $300 on new fishing equipment, if that store's, 
if the majority of that store's um, revenue comes from firearms, firearms accessories as defined in this bill, anything that's purchased at that store is going to be flagged as a firearm purchase, even if no firearms, ammunition, or accessories were even purchased. And so we have a, a clear-cut case of false positives emerging from this legislation in which our local hunting, fishing, bait and tackle stores, our local gun stores that sell things other than firearms are potentially going to have to report a merchant category code, code for firearm sales when no firearms, ammunition, or accessories were even sold. It was fishing rods, fishing reels, lures, et cetera, and so forth. Contrast that with the false negatives that are here. Merchant category codes are a thing. They already exist. And again, as we mentioned, since they do not track the actual items purchased, this is not a line item for what was um, acquired, it tracks the retailer from which these things were purchased, you have a large category of sporting goods stores in which you can buy all sorts of sporting goods stuff, canoes and tents and sleeping bags, and yes, firearms, firearms, accessories, and ammunitions. But because those sporting goods stores already have an existent, existing merchant category code, I could walk into any one of these sporting goods stores, purchase firearms, and it would be flagged as sporting goods. So this bill is full of false positives and false negatives. And that leads to the next point, which is that We've heard it, we've heard that part of the reason for bringing this bill is that this policy will give law enforcement the tools that they need to keep our communities safer. Well, I see holes in that argument because when I go look to see what law enforcement um, in, um, groups have weighed in on this, I see one group representing chiefs of police that's listed in a monitor position, which leads me to believe that what this bill provides is not actually that helpful to the folks that are doing the day-to-day -day work of investigating these crimes and trying to keep our community safe. If this brought a viable tool that law enforcement community safety needed, then I would expect to see more involvement or engagement. But I see effectively no involvement or engagement from any of the folks that are tasked with keeping our communities safe which means that I can only believe that this doesn't actually provide a useful tool. And that is corroborated with my own experience uh, with over a decade of full-time law enforcement service in which I did a lot of these investigations and I had to write warrants to go look at financial transactions and things of that nature. I don't see anywhere that this tool would actually provide something additional to help law enforcement keep our communities safe. And then we had a, a conversation. I tried to keep it light uh, when we were uh, discussing this on seconds, but the concern is still there, which is that the definition of firearms accessories in this bill is entirely, entirely too broad. Again, I'll refresh your memory. A firearms accessory means a device designed or adapted to be inserted into, attached to, or used with a firearm if the device alters the firing capabilities, the lethality, or the shooter's ability to hold or use the firearm. Folks, that's basically everything. As we talked about, I can walk into the forest, I can walk into the local park, grab a fallen stick, sharpen it to a point on the sidewalk. Any of you guys do that as a kid? I don't know, my brothers and I did that a lot. Sharpen it into a point on the sidewalk, and duct tape that to a firearm. That's a makeshift bayonet. Did that increase the lethality of the firearm? If so, I adapted a stick using a roll of tape to attach something that was either designed or adapted to be used in conjunction with a firearm to potentially increase its lethality. I have a huge problem with that definition of a firearm accessory because it's overly broad and it extends to so many different items. And I don't think that we should be passing policies that have such a overly broad impact. So for these and a variety of other reasons, I rise in opposition to this bill. Oh yeah, one last thing that I forgot to mention. 
Whenever we have these conversations, we always talk about keeping the community safer. Well, you guys know me, I like numbers, I like data, so I'll throw out some data for you that specifically relates to this piece of legislation. In 2019, and this data is from the state of Colorado's official, I forget the name of it, the, like the Crime Portal uh, website, um, but it's the official state of Colorado site. In 2019, 6,180 crimes were committed by criminals using a firearm. Fast forward a few years later to 2023, you now have 9,921 crimes committed by criminals using firearms. So in those five years, an increase from 6,180 to 9,921. How does that relate to this bill? Well, every time we have conversations about firearms, we always talk about keeping the community safer. From 2019 to 2023, we had 12 bills passed that dealt with firearms. And I don't really see the community get safer as evidenced by those numbers. So I question whether or not this piece of legislation, this bill is actually going to keep our community safer when we can see the trend over the last five years with numerous pieces of legislation uh, impacting and restricting and regulated firearms being passed. We can see that trend hasn't done anything to keep the community safer. I don't see any reason to believe that this bill will reverse that trend of firearm crime, of, of criminals using firearms uh, going up at the same time that more gun control legislation is passed. I think that it is an opportunity cost question as we spend time arguing about these bills. We're actually not using that time to have practical and effective discussions about how we keep our community safe. So for these and numerous other reasons, I will be a no on Senate Bill 66. Representative Bradley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker Pro Tem. Um, I came up here because I feel like the bill sponsors kept saying, this is regulation on the credit card companies. Why do we care so much about the credit card companies? Um, but I think like the representative from Douglas County said, we know what this entails. We know that this is going to eventually be an attack on the innocent, innocent firearm retailer who's just complying with existing law. Retailers who are running their small businesses and cooperating under the incessant regulations that this body continues to legislate on them. We continue to treat them like criminals for owning stores that help people like me purchase guns and ammunition to protect myself and my family. I talk about, Bill, about guns being the great equalizer for women. And it is, and I know the men in this body maybe don't understand that, but that is the one thing that equalizes us. It is the one thing that makes me feel safe, and whether you agree with it or not, it protects me. I like having my nine millimeter right beside me when I go to bed at night and my husband's out of town. And you're gonna continue to strip away my ability to defend myself bill by bill by bill in this chamber. And like the good representative just said, let's quote this again, firearms used to commit crimes in 2019 was about 6,000, and now it's, we're almost at 10,000. And I'm sure MCCs are gonna help prevent that 4,000% increase, right? Firearms used to commit crimes are often obtained legally first and then end up in the hands of criminals through illegal measures. Theft of firearms is at an all-time high and instead of penalizing the theft of firearms that are used to commit crimes, we leave these crimes as like petty theft instead of a felony, which is mind boggling to me because we're sitting here, both two representatives now have said that firearm crimes have gone up 4,000 crimes in five years. And when we bring bills forward to make the theft a felony instead of a petty theft, oh no, we can't do that. We can't possibly do that. We're, let's put an MCC code on them because that will stop it. We even took it a step further by reducing the penalty for breaking into a vehicle when Colorado is one of the highest in property and auto theft. But don't worry now because your gun will be safely stored in the lockbox of the stolen car, so we all should be okay with this now. We're the fourth least safe state in the United States, and I don't care what statistics you bring to say that that's not true. Talk to your constituents. Their cars are being stolen. Their, their homes are being broken into. It's happening. And you can, you can try to push that false narrative, but we all see it. We're not blind. California and Colorado would be the only states with legislation like this, whereas five other states, red and blue, New Jersey, Wisconsin, Utah, uh, Georgia, and Kentucky, 
are prohibiting financial service companies from using a gun MCC. So we're one of two going the complete opposite way. And has California, this is my question, what does California do since they've passed this legislation? Have they stopped anything with these MCC codes? And we had a witness who researched that. And there was no research to show that an MCC code has stopped really anything. So we are going to legislate on something that is not preventable. But we're so hell-bent at going against the purchaser's privacy in this instance. Shouldn't it be because there was research to provide that these MCC codes are stopping crime left and right? One instance. California's had this law. One instance where it's happened. Purchasing data should have protections and not be used against law-abiding citizens, especially when those rights are protected by a constitutional amendment. The bill sponsors joke that all purchases can be tracked, like fast food and shoes, but we aren't asking those to be tracked. And the House sponsors actually repeatedly told us this would not be used to track people when the Senate sponsor went on record saying that purchases would only be tracked if they roused suspicion. What? So two say no, one says yes. Similar to how banks may notify customers if a purchase raised suspicion of fraud. Tell me the metrics and standards. I have four children that can legally own guns soon. So if I go in and buy four guns for my sons and one gun for myself, along with ammunition because we love to go skeet shooting and we love to sight in their rifles, am I suspicious now? Because I've bought five guns. Am I going to go shoot up a school? Am I going to go shoot up a church? Am I suspicious now? When does the purchase rouse suspicion to go against my God-given constitutional rights? And have you talked to the credit card companies? Because they don't seem to be ready to provide MCC codes, and now the AG is going to start issuing $10,000 fines against them. And where, when I present, and people have questions on the fiscal note, where's the fiscal note? You have an updated fiscal note. Everybody's so absorbed with the fiscal note. There's not even a fiscal note of this. Yet the AG's office is going to be able to issue warrants. That didn't cost anything. We just go pick it off a tree. The AG's office will now have complete authority, which is alarming, as the AG's office is in support of infringement gun control. This is a clear bias that will take place with the AG having exclusive authority. We should all be concerned and the sponsors have made it seem like this bill is going to thwart all kinds of crime, which seems silly to me, since the criminals will still be accumulating guns and performing the same crimes they've been doing. We just, I just showed you there's been a 4,000 case increase. How does an MCC code prevent a crime with an illegally acquired gun, the ones that are used in the crimes? It doesn't. It just is more legislation against law-abiding citizens, just like all the other useless legislation that gets passed in this chamber. The bill sponsors compare this bill to stopping trafficking rings, which I- Representative Bradley, um, yeah. calling all this legislation useless uh, can be difficult and offensive. Just to ask you to speak respectfully to the work of the body. Thank you. Thank you. The bill sponsors compared this bill to stopping trafficking rings, which I find odd given their voting history of not prosecuting them. The FBI has had prior knowledge of several mass shooters before their crimes occurred, yet the shooting still happened because inaction took place. So who is to say that while spying on consumers like you and me, and you flag someone, that anything will happen in the first place because it is all so subjective? You will be going after law-abiding citizens while letting criminals roam free, and I think this is fear-mongering. I think this is straw man tactics. This is a roundabout way to implement backdoor registration for firearms without explicitly saying it. The representative from Douglas County has already told you federal law has restrictions on developing a national firearm registry. Therefore, the state cannot do that and they need a way around it. So here is our solution. And I love that we say, because we've done this to one of my bills, oh, the federal government is going to take care of it on my bill. And the state doesn't have control, but we heard a couple other bills where now the state should have control and the federal government's not moving fast enough. A bill that uses MCCs on firearms and firearm accessories to create a database of retailers selling these items and those who purchase them and now a third party owns our data. And for what? 
my privacy and the privacy of my constituents is being breached for an unenforceable bill that will not help protect anyone. Criminals aren't buying their guns with a credit card or a check. They're not rolling up into the gun store and throwing their information on file. Thanks to Colorado legislators, they are breaking into our homes and cars to steal them because they know that crime here is only a slap on the wrist. This bill is just like all other gun legislation we are seeing this session will have a lasting impact. However, not the one the Democrats are suggesting. These bills, like all other anti-Second Amendment bills, will penalize and victimize the law-abiding, de-incentivize firearm dealers and retailers, and effectively do nothing to stop criminals or end gun violence. What a shame. This is against our constitutional rights and should be voted down. And for my constituents and the good constituents out there, the good gun-toting lovers of the Second Amendment, buy often and use cash. Representative Hartsook. Good afternoon now, Madam Speaker. Good afternoon. Thank you so kindly. So, the bill's interesting in several aspects. We, we talk about that we want to reduce the violence that's out there. We've got a bill that specifically is for merchants and talking about using codes. And so what are codes used for? Codes are used for tracking. We use them. There's tax codes. There's traffic codes. There's all kinds of codes. You get a speeding ticket. Everything is used for tracking. Now we have a code for weapons. But who does it apply to? Because specifically in the bill it says certain networks. It doesn't say all. It doesn't say everybody. It says certain. So you're certainly small gun shops will be hit. We talked earlier before on this floor and in other debates, the impacts to small businesses. We've heard about how the state is not business friendly. We're now the 38th in the nation. We keep tacking on rules, regulations, fees, services, etc on small businesses. This will not hurt the bottom line of the big box stores because they could cost shift everything around. But if you're a small business owner and you're dealing with guns, you're dealing in a repair shop, you're dealing with modifications. When I was in the army, I went through armor school. I had friends that went through armor school and then they started small businesses. They could do modifications and they bought parts and everything. All these codes now would do is track them. We're also talking about fees. So do we ever consider the second, third order effects here? Do we honestly think that if we pass another piece of legislation and require credit card companies to do something, who's that cost going to get passed down to? Oh, I know, I know. It'll be the businesses. And who do you think they're going to pass it to? The consumer. So what happens in the end? Inflation goes up. Costs go up. Everything goes up. To achieve what? As I spoke against this bill in seconds, 2020 hindsight is great. But it doesn't help prevent anything. The registry that this will create and tracking due to the codes. If you're a criminal, if you are mentally unbalanced and intent on doing insane things out there, you probably don't use this system. Bad guys throughout the world do not walk around, whip out their credit cards, and buy a bunch of weapons, munitions, and explosives. It's not how they do business. Yet, we want to implement a law that's going to do that, in particularly harming our small businesses here. 
Other thing that's interesting is it talks about if the Attorney General's office prevails in an action. So if we run through this scenario and the Attorney General brings action, levies a fine, then they go to court, who ends up footing that bill? The government. Who funds the government? The taxpayers. So once again, we are putting the taxpayer on the hook on both ends here. If they have to buy something or they're a small business, there's fees. The companies recording it have fees. And if the government gets involved in some lawsuits here, then the taxpayer will be funding that too. So in the end, we whack the taxpayer over and over and over again. To achieve what? Not much from this bill. We certainly won't be able to achieve deterring psychopaths out there from committing mass murder. Do you honestly think they give one? Yeah, you know the word was I was gonna say. Care about this bill, about these laws? I promise you they don't. And the more we fool ourselves into thinking legislation after legislation is gonna stop the psychopaths doesn't work. We need to interdict them ahead of time. We need to put the ones we catch in prison instead of letting them go. We need to get serious about our laws for protecting public safety and not going after our small businesses. I urge a no vote. Thank you. Re Representative Bottoms. Thank you, Madam Speaker. This, uh, this bill is not a good bill. I talked about it some on seconds with this, but I want to encapsulate, I think, some of the things that uh, my constituents have already said. But what this bill does not do is keep anybody safe and stop shootings. It's just not going to do that. It has, actually has no possible way to accomplish that. But what it does do is it invades the privacy of our citizens, horribly invades the privacy of our citizens. You say, well, there's no difference between this merchant code and, say, a merchant code on groceries, except the merchant code on gro groceries doesn't have a $10,000 fine attached to it. So, yeah, it's very different. Uh, this one is designed to be attacking and punitive when it comes to somebody that is, is uh, using their credit card to purchase a firearm. Um, it invades the privacy of every person that has a desire to purchase these firearms. It's, it's not anybody's business whether I go to a gun store and purchase a set of headphones or purchase a firearm. It's nobody's business. It's nobody's business what, what firearm I decide to purchase if I do. It's, um, e even though our representative from Douglas County told you what caliber her gun is beside her bed, um, it's not your business if she decides to do the smart thing and upgrade to a 45. That is nobody's business. It's nobody's business whether any one of us are, are carrying a firearm under any circumstance. And so it's, it's a, it is an invasion of privacy. The next thing is, it is this is most definitely uh, the building of a registry. There's no other reason for it. Uh, same thing as serial numbers and all this other stuff. This, the only reason this exists is to build a registry. Um, because if, again, if it wasn't, if this was just for uh, data, if this was just for marketing data, why are we fining the credit card companies for uh, choosing to not def uh, limit or define, narrowly define this uh, particular piece of data? It's because it has nothing to do with marketing. It has to do with uh, building a registry to make sure we know when, when the government goes south to know who's carrying firearms. That's what this is about. When somebody wants to come after your children, you have firearms. That's what this is about. And so the, the idea that it's not a registry code is just, is, is, um, just not true. Uh, the other side of this is now the credit card companies can sell this information to whoever. And you say, well, we're, credit card companies can't sell this information. That happens all the time. Or what happens when you have a breach and 20 million people's information is now out there. And by the way, we all know in this room that happens all the time. 
So now you have 20 million people's firearm information out there that will be weaponized against them, will be used against them in many different ways. And that's if the credit card companies have not already sold it, which is going to happen uh, ad nauseum. And so this entire, this entire uh, bill is built around some, some really false ideas, and we all know what it's actually going to accomplish and to, to uh, use the same information that um, our representative from Douglas County said, why don't, why don't we just own that? Why don't, why don't we just own that and get up here and say, uh, this bill is to build a registry, because that's what it is. Representative Garcia, and then Armagost. Thank you, Madam Speaker. <clears throat> Members, we, every time we have a, a gun bill, we hear that it's an attack on our Second Amendment rights. When we're talking about merchant codes, we also have a First Amendment right. First Amendment right is to freedom of religion. In our merchant codes, we have two merchant codes, 8661, 5973, that explicitly track the purchase of religious goods, that explicitly track donations to religious charities. We're not up in arms because we're tracking religious contributions. I don't see a bill coming against that. This is simply to allow us to be able to, when an investigation is warranted, to assist our law enforcement in helping them to make sure that they can actually find the perpetrator. A merchant code is not readily available to anybody. I can't call Visa and say, I need to know who has a merchant code of 5730 and will get it. It is not a violation of privacy. It is putting in place systems that will allow our law enforcement to do their jobs better. And I urge a yes vote. Representative Armagost. Thank you, Madam Speaker. So I think that was pretty telling on the, the last representative to give testimony here. This is something that we do not need. This is something that is essentially as we said in second reading, as we said in committee, this is something that is unenforceable. It's, it's not something that's going to prevent anything. It's something that has really suspicious underlying directions. So the, the idea of this being enforceable, if, the idea of an investigation, if we're talking about a red flag investigation, we're talking about something that's after the fact. If there's ever something that's prior to an, an incident happening, this is not something that's reported. With everything that we have in place with red flag gun law, the fact that those still occur, those, is, those incidents still occur, and those people would come forward and say, yeah, there were these, red, the, these actual red flags that people noticed, but nobody reported. So the, these investigations occur after the fact. So the idea of them preventing something, no. The idea of them being used erroneously and possibly uh, violating, even though it's not intended to do that, violating people's privacy is gonna bring lawsuits. People are gonna be uh, inappropriately targeted. People are gonna be inappropriately accused of this or that because they made purchases that matched some sort of a pattern that triggered something or other and they get contacted by some, some law enforcement agency by the look of other legislation that might be a CBI, I'm not sure. However, this is something that people are gonna be targeted for, but not appropriately that are going to prevent anything from happening. These incidents that happen are people that are, we need to focus on other issues to be able to get those, those people drawn out and those people get to them before they get to a moment of crisis. When they're in that moment of crisis and somebody acts out with whatever tool that they have, the investigation that happens, again, is retroactive. We didn't prevent anything. All that we're doing is being able to say, oh, this happened, but we missed it. Um, on the contrary, though, the, the fact that there are going to be people and people that I interact with, not only as a, an instructor myself and training myself for my own proficiency, I would be targeted by my purchases. I would tell a student of mine to go purchase 
so many rounds of ammunition, this firearm and this, this holster and equipment, and they could be targeted. The fact that those purchases on a credit card at a firearm retailer are going to flag somebody inappropriately and potentially get them contacted by law enforcement is wildly inappropriate. There are other ways to address the issue. I know we all, every time we have one of these bills come up, we all agree that there is a crisis with people resorting to violence with mental health issues. There, there's no reason people should be resorting to violence with mental health issues. But we can't go after the law-abiding citizens who are buying firearms to protect themselves from those people and restricting them further from purchasing firearms to protect themselves from those people. So when people are in crisis and people do act out, the fact that somebody was not able to be armed in whatever location, whatever safe space or anything that they uh, are affected by in, in this legislature, that's on us as legislators. We're not allowing law-abiding citizens by all of these death by a million cuts, all of these bills that we're pushing through that are restricting law-abiding citizens from purchasing firearms. Restricting them by all of the red tape that they have to go through, potential liability and all these different costs and taxes that everyone has to pay just to own firearms and ammunition and equipment to protect themselves. They're either not going to be able to protect themselves and we're going to have more and more soft targets and more and more of these incidents, or we're gonna have people that are just, again, erroneously targeted and affected by bills that are more so going to affect them than they are preventing anything bad from happening. So th this is the wrong direction, and I say that every time, but again, we keep legislating these bills that go in the wrong direction. We keep digging further. And I, I can't explain why without impugning. So the only thing I can say is we, there has to be more communication before we bring legislation like this forward. There has to be more talking to people with a little bit of experience in the firearms arena, a little bit of experience in self-defense, a little bit of experience in, in firearms safety, hunter education, anything. There are p those of us in here that can actually help make good legislation to, for guns that don't impact law-abiding gun owners. There are those of us from the criminal justice and or law enforcement background that know how to address crime without impacting, Im negatively impacting the law-abiding citizens. Unfortunately, that legislation doesn't pass here. We need to work harder at making good legislation pass and this legislation not get introduced. I encourage a no vote. I will be one. Thank you. Representative Catlin. Thank you, Madam Speaker. It's still an honor to serve with you. And it is still an honor to serve with you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Members, I'm, I'm here simply because I want to talk about something that they haven't talked about yet. I talked about it on seconds, I believe. I talked talk to you about the business people that are selling weapons and selling ammunition. So these, I, I'll tell you, I don't understand all of this merchant code and all of those type of things. I do understand being worried about it. And I think that's what you're hearing here today. Maybe we don't know enough about this, so just bringing it up and saying, let's try and do it, is enough for people to say, hey, wait, we don't understand it. We'd like to know more about it. I'm probably in that category. But I do wonder and worry about the individuals that own these small gun stores. If they get to be real successful, sell a whole lot of weapons or a whole lot of units, Will somebody start looking a little closer at them as to what are they doing, how are they doing it, why are they doing it? Because, you know, we do have that Second Amendment right. And when people worry about it being changed or it being taken away, there seems to be a surge in the number of weapons that are sold and the number of, of units of ammunition. We, keep, we read almost monthly that the month that we just went past was higher than the month before. 
and we are continuing to be the best armed citizenry in the world. And I'm proud of that because I think that keeps a lot of foreign people looking at us like, no, nah, we don't want to take them on yet. And I think from, a per from, a, from an inside the country point of view, we should be trying to help with some of that. If this bill were saying that, I'd vote yes. But I don't see how this is helping. You know, we were just told that they're tracking my religious behavior. Who? Why? Where? But yet we're going to pass another bill to track my behavior. Who? Why and where are they tracking? We've just been told that that's happening on religion. So I worry about those things. Just chipping away little bits of my freedom. Little bits of my kids' freedom. And my neighbors'. I guess if it's just a little bit at a time, it doesn't hurt as bad. But sooner or later, little bits add up to big things. Really, I'd ask you to vote no on this bill for a whole lot of reasons. But I think the main reason is why, who, and where. Representative Holtor. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Testing one, two, testing. Okay, it's working good. Robin, can you turn it up a little, please? Thank you. Appreciate it. So, here we are with another gun bill. But this bill, the credit card companies cannot even don't have the capacity to, and probably, if they do, violate people's First Amendment rights in the Constitution. I would think the bill sponsors, some of them with legal training, might consider that. In fact, I'd ask them to opine when they get the chance to come up and discuss why we would be running a bill. Firearms Merchant Category Code that probably could very arguably be struck down in court by legal challenge. <clears throat> Under constitutional provisions, just saying, why do we do that? And like many of my colleagues have said before, this bill doesn't even address the real problem. If we think guns are not going to get in the hands of criminals, wake up, Colorado. If we think this is going to stop the mental health crisis and those people that are actually going to exact violence on good citizens in Boulder County or Jefferson County or Arapahoe County or any other county, perhaps even in Washington County, my home county, this isn't going to do it. Failed public policy, if that's your goal to the sponsors, and to all those that want to support this failed public policy. Now, it's even more contentious than that. Because you see, many people have said, well, this is just a back door for gun registration. But I would argue it's even more contentious than that, my good friends and colleagues. Because here we go, weaponizing departments. What did you say, Holtorf? Weaponizing departments? Why, yes, because now this bill gives the Attorney General's office exclusive authority to enforce this bill. Exclusive. So the AG is going to go after all these gun stores. 
Lawfare is a new word. I didn't even know what that meant till like this session. I know I'm from the country. We still use smoke signals in the Pony Express. So what are we doing? If you don't want to trust your government, then pass bills that empower your government to have exclusive authority to enforce certain laws, bringing on enforcement action against citizens and good, honest people running their businesses. In this particular case, it's firearms. What's next? I guess open the door, it can be anything. And there's just a small $10,000 penalty. That's not much. Or an injunction. You know, I don't, I don't understand, um, you know, they can issue court orders, pay attorney's fees and costs. So that store, that small business has to uh, stand all of the legal costs as the law, the Attorney General piles on. And I think the Attorney General has, how many attorneys work for the Attorney General now? 20, 30, 40, 50, 60? Need more FTEs, let's go add that too. We're gonna need more FTEs, guys. Let's grow government a little more too. So much to do, so little time. In Colorado, citizens want to trust their government. They want to trust the departments. They even actually want to make sure the Attorney General's office is taking care of their rights as citizens, not coming after them and attacking citizens and small business. Because we want to exact this new word called lawfare. The state coming down, I don't know, like a big tarantula just coming down on everybody. Arachnid, arachna lawfare. I'm trying to have a little sense of humor up here, but this isn't funny. There's nothing funny about what we're doing here. Not with this legislation. <clears throat> now, I looked at the fiscal note, and it says, oh, no appropriation required. <laughs> really? Well, we got this flag where I'm from. I won't tell you what it's called, but is synonymous with bovine fecal excrement. Okay. Representative. Yes, ma'am. Did I make a mistake, ma'am? Please stay focused on the bill or the fiscal note. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. I won't talk about BFE. That's not a place in Egypt. All right, I'm going to get back to the bill before I get in trouble. You know, the engrossed version, and I understand, you know, we, we try to help. You, you try to make a bad bill less bad. Um, but, you know, if it's bad, it's bad, and you can't put lipstick on a pig because it's still a pig. We say that where I'm from. It's still a pig. So, I don't know what we're trying to do. I don't know what the sponsors are trying to do. I see the Senate sponsor is Senator Sullivan. That makes people in, the, uh, in my eastern Colorado, in my district, very concerned. Representative Holtorf. Yes, ma'am. Please. Thank you. Uh, I, I'll withdraw that last comment because I do understand you're leading me back on the path of staying Focused and not uh, impugning anybody. Thank you. But the constant, yes, ma'am, the constant attacks, the constant um, legislation against the firearms businesses. Do you understand in rural Colorado, when you do this, all you do is accelerate firearm sales? Do you guys understand that? And then a lot of people, you know, whether you got a credit card or not, my wife didn't let me take one to town this week. She's got the credit card. Um, so I'm on the budget. Um, they're not going to buy these. If you think this is going to change and deter the transaction and sale of firearms, 
Boy, you're, you're grossly mistaken, bill sponsors. Grossly mistaken, if this is going to change anything. And criminals aren't going to be deterred. I don't think too many of you even have a credit card. When they fill out the application, they probably won't even get it approved if they did. Anybody think about that? So good, honest citizens now are going to be doing their transactions, and then they're going to have this thing done to them that's probably unconstitutional. And then there's going to be challenges for the credit card companies because now they're going to have to face that litigation. And arguably the credit card companies have already said they're not doing it. We're not doing it. I kind of like that. We're not doing it. Don't do it. If it's an unconstitutional law, don't do it. Representative Holtor, if yes, you have one minute remaining. Thank you. So I don't know where we're going, but I know that this isn't going to fix anything. And it's just going to make the Attorney General's office have more exclusive authority to come after good businesses in Colorado. And if you think that's what you want, vote yes. Everybody vote yes if you want more authority and you want more good small businesses to be subject to this type of authoritative type legislation because they don't comply with this illegal, unconstitutional law. I'll be a no on many fronts. But first of all, the back door for registration, the fact that it violates privacy and, and disclosure between a client and a customer, which is the credit card holder and the credit card company. I mean, these are real issues. Where does it end? How many violations to the Constitution do you want to throw? And no, California doesn't have it right. Oregon doesn't have it right. Representative Holtorf, your time has expired. Thank you, ma'am. Don't want Colorado to be California. Thank you. Representative Taggart, this is your second time to speak to the bill. You have three minutes and 11 seconds remaining. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, I came down here to apologize, and I talked to the bill, two bill sponsors that ISO, in all my years as being a member of my corporation, would never have ventured into this subject. But in September 2022, they did, in fact, venture into this under pressure. And while it somewhat surprised me, um, I felt it necessary to apologize on, on the record that I had incorrect information. It doesn't change my mind on the bill. I do want to read what one of the three largest credit card companies quoted with respect to this, though, and I'll read it without mentioning the credit card company because it is one of the three largest. We now turn our focus to how it will be implemented by merchants and their banks as we continue to support lawful purchases on our network while protecting the privacy and decisions of individual cardholders. So one of the largest three has said, by way of this quote, or by way of this statement, I should say, they don't know how to implement this. Thank you. Assistant Minority Leader Winter. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I won't be up here long. I spoke on this bill in seconds. And all that I ask is, is let's just be out, out front about what this bill is about. I mean, those folks of, of ours that su support the Second Amendment and watch over these presidings, they know what this bill is about. Um, no matter what we say about it, they see the forest through the trees, they know this bill is to end up with a registration at some point or a registry. And they can see that, most of it can see that. We can say that isn't what it is, but in the long run, whether um, you're doing it for that reason or not, this will be a tool that will be able to be used. And it may not put a finger on every firearm that was purchased, but it's sure gonna help collate things and bring it to that process. Like I said before, legislation like this leads to registration. That registration at some point could and will probably lead to attempt of confiscation, which for those that aren't willing to give up their firearms, 
this will end up in conflict. And that is not a good thing. Not a good thing for this country, not a good thing for the world, but the fact of the matter is, is people may not want to say it, but I was elected to say the truth, and that's what I'm here to do. People that support the Constitution and the Second Amendment believe that the Second Amendment allows us to keep all of our other freedoms in this country. I am a watcher of history, and you don't have to go far back into history to see what happens to societies that allow government to willingly take their firearms. Not a good thing. Not up here spewing lies or making things up. You all have Google. You can go take a look for yourself. I think what's unfortunate is, is there's many times that we sit around and we talk like it couldn't happen in the United States of America. And I think that that's probably the most egregious thing that we could even think. Don't get me wrong, this is the best country on earth. I'm an honor, I'm, I'm honored to represent United States citizens in this chamber and the citizens of Colorado. But the founding fathers, like we talked about them earlier, when they wrote this, there was a reason that they wrote this. I said before, this was a group of men that had no idea what freedom really was. I mean, it was a brand new idea. It was something that had never been tried before, and they risked everything. They risked life, liberty, pursuit Excuse of happiness. Excuse me, AML Winter. Members, we are on third readings. I'll ask you to take your seats. Thank you. Please they, proceed. Thank you, ma'am. They risked life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. They risked their families. They were being tarred and feathered, split and quartered. We cannot forget the things that our founding fathers did to make this a free nation and to put those words on parchment. And that's why myself and my colleagues fight so furious for these things. This is another piece of legislation that is death by a thousand cuts. And I have no problem calling it out for that. And I don't think anybody else should have a problem with just being honest about this. And right now we're just at a, we're just at a, at a standoff when it comes to this. I think this is an attack on law-abiding citizens. I think the statistics show that most law-abiding citizens, this will affect them at some point. I think this will open up for investigations on good people. You know, we, we talked, I think it was last year, about no-knock warrants. I think that was something that was discussed in this chamber. And I think this could lead to a lot of those things. I mean, this could lead to no-knock. This could lead to conflict. And maybe the way the re legislation is written now, that may not be your intent, but what our intent is today can be used against us in the future, and that's what I'm afraid of. I mean, when we discuss things such as no-knock, and then we pass legislation like this where, where somebody spoke that they go out for a, a weekend of, of shooting, and for those of you that have never done this, it is a, a quite expensive adventure to go out and do these things. And for some people, it may not be understand, but it's a part of our culture. We talk about culture all the time. Well, where I'm from, I grew up in 4-H. We shot every weekend. It's something we do as a family. We hunt, we target shoot. It's part of our culture and our fabric of life, especially in rural Colorado. So if you do these things, and it does pop up, and it leads to a possible no-knocker for them to come to your property, it comes to the conflict part that we're talking about. And if we're gonna talk about these things, we can't talk about conflict one year, and then the next year not expect for the same type of thing to happen. This could really wrap up some good people into something bad happening here in the near future. And I don't want to see that happen. So as I stand here today, I stand for the Second Amendment. I'm not afraid to do it. I'd stand up here a million times and say I stand for the Second Amendment. I will fight to preserve the Second Amendment as long as Rep. Winter has breath in him. So on behalf of House District 47, all the God-fearing American patriots in the state of Colorado know that myself and the Mighty 19 will stand up here. We will fight for your constitutional rights. We will not back down. We see the forest for the trees. And like my colleague from Douglas County said before, cash is king. Representative Armagas, this is your second time to speak. You have four minutes and 14 seconds remaining. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I, I forgot something that our assistant minority leader reminded me of. Mentioned it in committee, I mentioned it in seconds, and it's still something that I'm hearing from my constituents. The fact that this is as suspicious as it looks uh, with the non-enforceable merchant category code that is not enforceable because it's avoidable. Um, and I, I think the biggest thing to focus on is out there looking into this building, we have 
a not, it's not even a partisan issue, but it, there is a lack of trust in our government. There is a lack of trust in our legislation. And clearly by legislation like this, our legislature appears to not trust its, its constituents, not trust the voters. The, the sad thing about that is we keep digging. We keep fueling that fire. We're not just fanning the flames. We're throwing a gas can on the fire of distrust between the citizens and the government of Colorado. And Bill's legislation like this exacerbates that beyond belief. Um, I just wish there was a way that we could work in a way that we can build trust back with, with our, our citizens in Colorado. I wish that there was a way that uh, we could trust them and they can trust us and we can build legislation that can build that trust between the two rather than drawing a more dividing line every single day we are in this building on the clock. And it is sad, but at the same time, it's still happening. So for all, all of the reasons you've heard today, and you're gonna hear more, but with the lack of trust that we have between our citizens and our state government and beyond, we need to work better at building that trust, not further destroying it. So again, I encourage a no vote. Thank you. Representative Luck. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Second Amendment is, is about life. It's about life. It's about the preservation of life. It's about the preservation of liberty and property as well, but most importantly, it's about the preservation of life. <laughs> There's so much to say about this bill. And not just because of this bill, but because of the overarching conversation that we've had in this building and continue to have in this building year after year around the Second Amendment. Taken on its own, one would say this is a reasonable measure. One might say, I wouldn't, but one might say this is a reasonable measure. But taken in conjunction with the myriad of other bills, one could genuinely argue that this is about encouraging death. Death. Here are a couple of things to consider. In 2021, there were 103 people killed as a result of active shooters. 103 people in the entirety of the United States in that one year. And each one of those people that died is inherently valuable and we should mourn them as a tragedy. This bill, as I understand it, was presented in committee for the purpose of combating those types of deaths, 103, 103 deaths. And yet, this bill and its companion bills that we have seen over the last couple of years and this year are likely to create a Colorado where firearms are non-existent. You've heard from my colleagues about the fear of this creating a registry. I'm less concerned about the registry in this particular conversation than about the impact it's going to have on small businesses that sell firearms. Because the disparity across jurisdictional boundaries of the rules related to whether you can or cannot employ merchant category codes may 
in conjunction with ESG standards and other voices within our communities and society, activist voices, result in credit card companies saying we're no longer going to do business with groups, businesses that do this kind of business. We're not gonna, we're not gonna wage in. And we know that the ATF at the federal level has said if you purchase firearms with cash, we consider that to be dangerous and we will look into it. As my colleague mentioned, there is a grow, actually most of my colleagues mentioned, there is a growing hostility, frustration, concern within those communities that abide the Second Amendment. And we have seen across this nation, it's not widely reported unless you follow these things, but we've seen across this nation, person after person die as a result of the ATF and law enforcement showing up at their door related to Second Amendment concerns. In 2021, there were 48,830 people who died as a result of firearms. Of those, 20,958 were murdered. The remaining 26,328 individuals committed suicide with firearm. Why do I tell you those specific numbers? Because I've been in this chamber for a number of years and we have had multiple gun bills every year. We have not had very many medical malpractice bills, though, however. Despite the fact that in 2018, John Hopkins did a study and found that there were over 250,000 Americans who died as a result of medical malpractice. We're being told that we need to do all of these things to eliminate guns in Colorado for 103 individuals. But what are we doing for those 250,000 plus? What are we doing to protect them from the scalpel? What drives this? We know from data, from data collected by people who by and large do not support the Second Amendment, that the protective use of firearms has preserved life in at least half a million cases every year. Half a million. Put on the scale to 103. And yet we continue to go after an industry and we continue to go after the right of people to be able to defend themselves in this building. Not only as individuals but also through the defunding of law enforcement. So not only can you not protect yourself, but the other institutions that are designed to help protect you, we continue to undermine as well. So death. Death, death, and more death. We have conversations about we need to remove firearms because of suicide. And yet we have a bill today to talk about empowering the medical field to advance suicide. More death. Where is the consistency in this? Luck, back to the bill. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Speaker, but these are valid questions. They're valid questions about where our heart is. What are we being driven by? By a political party's agenda? By donors? By fear? What is it? Because I can't, I don't know, I don't understand. I don't understand why we continue bill after bill after bill to go after people's unalienable right to defend themselves and make no mistake, people will continue to seek to defend themselves. And so you remove firearms, okay, well then the next thing will be knives, or machetes, or acid. If you've traveled the world, you know that there are a myriad of different weapons out there, tools out there that people use to harm others and that they use to defend themselves. Why do we have a problem with people defending themselves? Why do we continue to pursue policies that haven't resulted in anything but additional harm? 
as has been stated by prior colleagues of mine. We were told, why are you debating this? We don't hear about religious codes being used. Well, for those who monitor that circle, you know that religious groups are being debanked. You also know that federal investigations have pursued banks, have asked banks for information related to certain categories of First Amendment freedoms. Political speech. To say that this will never be weaponized is naive at best. To say that this doesn't attack individuals who desire to protect themselves or provide a living for themselves and their families as a result of empowering others to protect themselves is naive at best. A core function of government, a core function, one of the things that is actually our role is to protect rights. Representative Luck, you have 30 seconds remaining. Thank you, Madam Speaker. As we continue to undermine rights, I believe it is the fact that we forfeit our right to justly and morally govern. We have lost our moral authority as we continue to, to, to take that which is not ours to take. Your time has expired. Minority Leader Puglisi. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, I do want to touch a little bit on the fiscal note. I made these comments on second reading and just want to reiterate just, um, you know, I, I really do believe in the policy and not this policy, but in policy in general. And um, the questions that I normally ask, regardless of whether I like a bill, is what does implementation look like? And so what, I, what I'm concerned about is a couple of things. One, I have yet to see a bill in any committee really that um, doesn't have an appropriation that is of this magnitude. And I know I have asked people to push back, even if I don't support their bill, on the fiscal note, because I think that a lot of departments can be doing this within existing appropriations. Um, I just find it interesting that now we're going to use existing appropriations, and I just don't think that's sustainable. Um, I'm also concerned, especially because the bill um, gives the Attorney General this exclusive authority to enforce this policy and has all sorts of requirements in it. I'm still confused why there would be no fiscal note. Um, I also, I pointed this out and I also just want to say that I don't, um, I don't like a one-sided prevailing party provision um, generally. And so this says that the, if the Attorney General prevails, the courts may require violators to pay reasonable attorney's fees, but not if the merchant um, prevails. And I just think that's very one-sided in this situation, not necessary. Um, the state revenue piece, it says, given the uncertainty about the number of cases that will be pursued by the Attorney General and with such a wide range of potential penalties, remember, anywhere up to $10,000 for each violation, um, the fiscal note can't be estimated. I think that that could be harmful to the state going forward. And then um, lastly, the most troubling part of the fiscal note to me is the part that says while the trial courts um, in the judicial department may experience an increase in workload and the attorney general may, um, it is assumed that most payment networks, merchant acquirers, and firearm merchants will follow the law, so therefore no change in appropriation is required. So when we go back to implementation, what you're saying is nobody's going to violate this law, so um, therefore we don't need more money, but we, they may violate the law, and if they do, here's what happens. And I, it just doesn't make sense to me. I think that... Um, I think that if you're going to have penalties in here, and I remember one of the sponsors kind of um, on one of the amendments we ran saying we were trying to protect credit card companies. I think we should be protecting all businesses in, um, in this chamber, but um, I really think it's just important 
that we have an implementation that makes sense. And if we're going to run a bill that doesn't actually, um, implementation doesn't work, then I think maybe we shouldn't be running that bill. So with that, I'm going to say um, that I'm a no vote and encourage you all to be a no vote as well. Thank you. Representative Mabry. Oh, Froelich. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Speaker. F folks, again, this is a simple bill, a simple change to current law that brings gun and ammunition merchants in line with other merchants. If you'd like to play at home, how about we pick our favorite merchant code, because there are three over 300. My personal favorite, telemarketing of travel-related services and vitamins. Bridge and tunnel road fees. Wire transfer money orders. Commercial equipment not elsewhere classified. Warehouse club gas. Warehouse clubs. Variety stores. Massage parlors. You get the picture. A simple change that is another step to making Colorado safer. Representative Mabry. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Members, to start, I just want to respond directly to a, to a critique that I've heard several times from a colleague on the other side of the aisle that I know is directed at me and how we approach these issues. Earlier this year, we heard legislation that would have increased the penalty on the theft of certain firearms. And I voted against that bill. And I did so because it would not have taken any weapons off the streets. In that committee hearing, I asked law enforcement officials what happens right now when someone gets caught with one of these stolen weapons. And the law enforcement officer said to me that they confiscate the weapons. As is, as under current law, they confiscate the weapons. So that bill would not have taken any guns off the streets. That happens under current law, as it stands. What that bill would have done is doubled down on our broken system of, of mass incarceration, where we know young people getting caught up in it for longer amounts of time leads to harsher results and, and more, more crime. The longer people are caught up in the system, the more likely they are to commit crimes. And so, and thank you for the latitude on that, uh, Madam Speaker. We did hear um, that addressed um, in this conversation. On this bill, specifically one thing I wanna know is more than 95% of Americans support background checks on the sale of weapons. And we have a system for background checks here in Colorado. So when you go buy a weapon, you give your name, you give information. People are talking about the right to privacy. When you're purchasing a gun, you're already giving a ton of information. They're already looking up what you have done in the past when you buy a weapon. And if you're not, then you're not following the law as the people of Colorado want you to be uh, uh, approaching purchasing a firearm. And so, you know, to those who are saying that this is creating a registry, I mean, to the extent that um, you're following current law, the, the, the registry on who is filing for a background track to purchase a weapon is, should be far more concerning than this, because this information is not maintained by the government. I also just want to touch on, um, uh, you know, I heard uh, one of my colleagues mention uh, no-knock warrants. I am opposed to no-knock warrants. If, if I thought that this had anything to do with no-knock warrants, my name would not be on this bill. This bill does not have any mandates that require searches. It does not say that anything in particular is suspicious. It just treats buying firearms like anything else. And you heard my co-prime sponsor. The, there are very narrow categories for things like buying vitamins on cruises. I don't know if that was exactly the one that you read, but we saw something like that. And so 
this just brings the firearm industry in line with basically every other industry. Industries as specific as, you know, I don't know if it was buying vitam vitamins on the cruise ship, but it was something like that. So with that, I will ask for a yes vote. Thank you. Seeing no further discussion, the motion before us is the adoption of Senate Bill 66 on third reading and final passage. Mr. Schiebel, please open the machine and members proceed to vote. Representative Leader is excused with a $5 fine. Please close the machine. With 38 aye, 21 no, and six excused, Senate Bill 66 is adopted. Co-sponsors. Please close the machine. Madam Majority Leader. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I move to lay over Senate Bill 68 until tomorrow. Seeing no objection, Senate Bill 68 will be laid over until tomorrow, April 9th, 2024. Madam Majority Leader. Madam Speaker, I move to lay over the balance of the calendar till Tuesday, April 9th, 2024. Seeing no objection, the balance of the calendar will be laid over until tomorrow, April 9th, 2024. Madam Majority Leader. Madam Speaker, I move that the House stand in recess until later today. The House will stand in recess until later today. <laughs> 